Hello everyone and a very good morning or good afternoon to all of you. Distinguished delegates, presenters and participants from SAC member states and region around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I am thankful to all of you for joining us in this SARC webinar on energy planning for cities of SARC in future. My name is Vaskar Pradhan and I am working as program leader energy trade at SARC Energy Center, Islamabad. I shall be moderating today's webinar. First of all, allow me to briefly speak about the center. The SARC Energy Center is a regional institute on energy and a technical arm for the SARC organization on energy matters. It is our endeavor to translate the energy vision of SARC leadership into reality. The center started its operation in year 2008. During the last 12 years, the center has played its role in all regional level energy initiatives. Until now, the center has carried out 140 plus interventions. The report of these interventions are available on the center's website. Dear participants, cities consume around 70% of global energy. With the increasing urbanization worldwide and their large energy footprint, cities are well positioned to have significant impact on energy use. Cities around the world are increasingly taking action to improve the sustainability through clean energy and energy efficiency measures. Many of the world's most polluted cities are in South Asia. In coming time, governments, regulators, and consumers will have even greater role to play if the region is to achieve the goal of sustainable development. The goal for the South countries should be focused on improvement in areas such as transportation, clean drinking water, water use, energy efficiency, green building, waste management, reducing carbon emissions, and so on. Ladies and gentlemen, I am also extremely grateful to our allied panel of speakers for this webinar. From India Smart Grid Forum, we have Mr. Rizik Kumar Pillai, President, Ms. Rina Suri, Executive Director, and Mr. Sudhasat Kundu, Senior Manager. And from PwC India, we have Mr. Sandak Kumar Mohanty, Director, Power and Utilities. We appreciate for their enthusiasm and willingness to share their thoughts on the subject, and I will introduce them in detail before the start of their presentations. We have four presentations for today's webinar. You will have the opportunity to ask questions to presenters by typing your questions into the attendee pane of the main window of GoToWebinar software. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentations. We will collect these and address them during the question and answer session at the end of the presentations. With this, I would like to introduce the two presenters who will be presenting on smart cities in India, opportunities and challenges, solutions and strategies. First, Mr. Rizi Kumar Pillai is the president of India Smart Grid Forum since its inception in 2011 and is also as a chairman of Global Smart Grid Federation since November 2016. He is an internationally renowned expert with over three decades of experience in electricity sector in diverse functions covering the entire value chain and across continents. He is spearheading a mission to leverage technology to transform the electric grid in India and light every home at affordable costs through sustainable development models. Mr. Rizzi played the pivotal role in formulation of smart grid vision and roadmap for India and the launch of national smart grid mission. And the second presenter, Mr. Sudhasat Kundu, is currently working as senior manager with ISGF and has an experience of more than 10 years in the energy sectors. He is an electrical engineer and has MBA in power management. He worked with various power and transport utilities multilateral and bilateral agencies across South and Southeast Asia on development of smart grid roadmap and other areas. With this, I would like you to go ahead with your presentation. Over to you, Mr. Rizisab and Mr. Kundu. Sir, you are not audible. Yeah, now, yeah, good, good morning, good afternoon, 
thank you very much for giving this opportunity to india smart grid forum to present our views and our work in the past on uh, smart grids and smart cities particularly in india and in the south asia southeast asia region uh, the, uh, as many of you would have heard uh, india is pursuing a very ambitious goal of building 100 smart cities and many of them are uh, in the existing cities itself building uh, making them intelligent and smart. So, it, on the smart city uh, background, I like to mention something which I have not known to many of you. Actually, the entire smart city work started in India in 2008-2009 time frame uh, for some special economic zones who requested that same automation systems for electricity, gas, water, transport, traffic, security, all that. So that some initial work which was done by IBM in India was taken by IBM globally. And in early 2009, IBM started a set of advertisement on Smarter Planet. A lot of solutions were promised and proposed, but many of them, there were no solutions. But globally, that movement of smart cities started in 2009, particularly by IBM, caught on by other IT companies and automation companies, Cisco, etc., came into presence. And next two, three years, we saw a lot of uh, activities around the globe on smart cities. Uh, different definitions came into place, different uh, technologies and solutions. Agencies uh, set out to build standards and uh, frameworks. A smart Cities Council was formed in the US by Jesse Best and uh, a set of uh, other technology companies and some of the cities. Uh, smart Cities Framework was launched sometime in 2013. All this uh, different work which happened and in 2014 our new government which came uh, under the leadership of Mr. Narendra Modi launched this 100 smart cities uh, uh, mission that's a time when we had published ISGF had published a document a white paper uh, recommending that uh, the, the digital assets of smart grid can be leveraged at marginal cost to build smarter cities basically in developing countries uh, electricity grid has several inefficiencies and that need to be uh, uh, resolved through technology and uh, automation so those assets digital assets which can be leveraged for other infrastructure domains such as water distribution gas distribution uh, traffic security safety all those uh, different domains that's a very important work which you have done in 2014 we released that white paper and in 2015 ieee started a, a series of conferences called smart grids for smart cities and uh, this is a rena will be later presenting uh, uh, how to leverage digital assets of smart grids for smart cities and what are it when we say so re regarding energy planning for smart cities uh, in the region uh, i like to uh, mention another very important fact uh, my first summer in Delhi was 1982. Uh, almost 40 years ago, when I came to Delhi, the population in Delhi was just 4 million. And the maximum temperature in 1982 in Delhi was in the range of 42 degrees centigrade. Compare that with 2019. Last year, the Delhi temperature went to 48.3. An increase of almost more than 6 degrees centigrade, which happened in last 36 37 years <coughs> out of this six degree at least four degree happened in last 10 years never we had temperature above 44 or 45 until 2008 2009 so at this rate by 2030 uh, most part of north india the same is uh, relevant for pakistan the temperature will go well beyond 50 degrees centigrade at 50 degrees centigrade People will find it extremely difficult to leave unless uh, workplaces and places to sleep, we provide them cooling. Can today uh, poor countries, developing countries, for billions of people, can we provide cooler workspaces and living areas is a major challenge. We are actually working on a paper which we expect to how what should be the modern design, how uh, this can be met majorly through solar energy uh, that work we expect to publish sometime in july this year so a quick look at the energy scenario of uh, sark countries uh, escape uh, next slide please uh, 
uh, about ISGF, we will omit. Most of you know ISGF. We have done uh, two important work for SARC Energy Center in 2018, which were presented also one on the smart grid roadmap for uh, all the SARC nations and another one on the electric mobility, which was presented last week on a webinar. So if you take the eight uh, con uh, countries, total installed capacity as of now is close to half a million megawatt. That's about 490,000 megawatt of uh, electricity generation we have uh, in, in all these countries. And when you look at 2030, this need to almost uh, go up by 50% and more than doubling by 2040. So this <coughs> still uh, the, the per capita energy consumption in all these countries are way below global average. In India, we are somewhere around 1100 kilowatt hour per person per year versus a global average of about 3200 kilowatt hour per person per year. And in developed countries, industrialized nations, and all these are above well above 10,000 uh, kilowatt hour per person. So, if we have to even uh, accounting for the energy efficiency and the new technologies which are emerging, uh, even uh, looking at that factor, if SARC nations have to become the developed countries, have the welfare, uh, welfare which uh, other countries or developed nations are enjoying our per capita energy consumption need to go somewhere near 4,000 to 5,000 units per person per year. So <coughs> that is, we are talking about a quadrupling or even more of that generation capacity in the coming years. Today, the uh, RE capacity in uh, India is about 87,000 megawatt. And all other countries put together, it comes to only another 2,000 megawatt. So we need to drastically increase this share. And in, India has committed in the Paris Agreement by, that by 2030, about 40% of our el electricity is going to come from renewable sources. So accordingly, we are presently making a plan to take our RE capacity to 450 gigawatt by 2030. We need to work and plan uh, in a coordinated manner that uh, renewable energy share increases and the hydro resources in this region, uh, it's, it's very rich in uh, hydro, particularly Nepal, Bhutan, these countries, hydro resources we need to uh, develop and also technologies like wave energy uh, or, or tech, etc. we need to tap to have a, <coughs> sorry, a, a richer renewable portfolio in this uh, ever increasing en energy uh, portfolio in the SAR countries. Next slide, please. At the same time, our population is also set to increase by almost 50% by 2030 or 2050. Next slide, please. Ah, yeah, here. We are taking the 2050. No, no, the previous one. Previous one, please. Yeah, the population. So in, in, in India, from 1.3 billion by 2030, we will become 150 and overtake China. And by 2050, we are expected to be 163 billion people. So same is the case with many other countries, except as smaller countries like Bhutan, Maldives, Sri Lanka, etc. All others, their population is going to go up drastically from 1.81 billion, we are 2.3 billion by 2050. So the per capita, which I said, uh, energy consumption need to increase, and also urbanization which today in India, almost 44, 45% of the people, uh, oh, sorry, 53% of the people in India live in urban areas already. Eh? Sorry, 40% now and uh, 2020, yeah, sorry, one third of the people, 33% people, 35% people live in urban area. By 2050, it is said to be more than 50%. And same is the story in all other developing countries, the urbanization going at full speed and cities we need to plan accordingly. So later I have a presentation where I'll talk about uh, 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 <coughs> how do we plan intelligent and smarter infrastructure which will last centuries, which, which will not become obsolete in a couple of decades. So next slide, we'll talk about the energy efficiency which we have done in India. In the last 15 years, India has done tremendously uh, well on the energy efficiency side. 
So you can see uh, about 89,000 crore is the annual saving in energy efficiency which we achieved. So about 27, 28,000 megawatt of energy savings which happened. It's, it's a, a consolidated program. <laughs> done one LED lamp, uh, more efficient pump sets, more efficient air conditioners, many of the appliances we have, the star rating, uh, which Bureau of Energy Efficiency when they started it. And it's going quite aggressively. And we have now buildings uh, being, uh, code being uh, uh, changed so, so that more energy efficient uh, buildings will be built. So this is something which has uh, nations, other countries which are ready to start on the energy efficiencies area need to look at it and also at electric vehicle so rest of the presentation will talk about the 100 smart cities program in india which i would request my colleague sk to take you forward thank you thank you sir uh, for about this you, uh, idea on this uh, for, yeah thank you sir for giving uh, for giving everyone the idea of this uh, what is the need for the smart cities and uh, thank you sark energy center for giving me the opportunity and good morning everyone so first uh, i will talk about the smart city mission in india as uh, already as our president already mentioned that what is the need for transition in energy because we are already being energy uh, resource constrained on the fossil fuel side and <clears throat> the, we are all with the covid also we can see that we need to be more sustainable we need to focus on more sustainable and instead of using the fossil fuel we should go more into the renewables and as the population is also increasing to cater the energy requirement of the increasing population we need to focus on on the demand side how we can save energy the demand response how the consumers can be in, included in the uh, as the producer what you call is the prosumers and uh, how this uh, distributed generation or the localized generations can be improved with the help of renewable energy like rooftop solar and others so with the smart city mission in India, this is the our present government uh, chaired by uh, our Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi has uh, come out with the national smart city mission, and that was the total smart cities, 100 number of smart cities. Total urban population to be impacted is you can see this uh, 99630 uh, 069. The total cost of projects will be in uh, it is in INR actually. This uh, and the total area uh, based on development call also in INR total pan city solution cost is you can see that's a huge investment that is being done actually to make this uh, 100 cities smart and more of the most of the investment and will be going into this automation and in and the uh development of the ict infrastructure so that we can better plan those cities and we can have a common command and control center from where we can uh control everything but this and we can uh what you call you can facilitate the population living in the city this is the list of smart cities that is uh, all uh, that is being given that is being out by uh, government of india in every state uh, there is a number of cities that is being allocated this number is presented here you can see the <coughs> in some of the states there are num uh, the numbers are like in gujarat there are six smart cities in uttar pradesh there are 13 in tamil nadu there are 12 in uh, west bengal there are four so like this, it sums up uh, there's 100 cities. This uh, cities has been uh, identified by the, uh, the, the panel of the smart city mission. And uh, based on, and also they decided the business models in which they will be, uh, like some will be the greenfield projects that will be newly developed and some will be the retrofitted with, uh, the, uh, with the inclusion of the ICT infrastructure with the existing infrastructure. So this is the smart city progress in India. If you can see that out of the one, uh, 5151 projects initially proposed actually the number of projects are the different projects that has been allocated in every city suppose one of uh, the smart water or smart gas or the smart metering these are uh, there's a single project that has been allocated in this way these are the number of projects that has been shown this is 5151 projects initially proposed and uh, 3629 have been actively pursued of these 25 percent of the projects have been completed but in value terms it is only just 11 percent you can see from the graph that the average cost of the completed projects per city versus the average number of completed projects. In this uh, graph, if you see there is a shaded area here, like the average West Bengal, Haryana, or it's shown, shown that the states in this shaded A section had lower average completion rate with lower average cost per project. Means the cost per project was be, uh, this average completion rate is much lower. And also in this 
section in this uh, Delhi Rajasthan MP Gujarat, you can see that they have, they have a better completion rate, average rate with higher average cost per project. The cost involved is higher and cost involved is lower also decides the, the completion rate of the project, if you, see, if you can see from the graph. And there are 41454 uh, smart city mission projects for 22 billion USD already tendered and out of these 1290 smart city projects worth 350 billion completed and are currently operational. So now we come to the main thing that is the smart city solution. These are some of the solutions. There are other solutions that can also be included in major solutions that we are, I have portrayed here, like the waste management, waste energy audit, waste to compost, waste water treatment, recycling, and reduction of CND waste. There are the water management, smart meter and management, leakage identification. So if you can see, there is it's all an interlink. If you can see that the uh, smart meters in the smart grid that we use on the electric utility, the same smart meters with the we can leverage the use of these of the SCADA and the GIS into the water management also. In Ahmedabad, the, with the use of SCADA, Ahmedabad municipal has 23 million liters of water per day. So you can see that uh, that the investment in the infrastructure of these these uh, automation systems have helped us to improve the quality of delivery as, a, as well as the prevent the leakage. And also this uh, leakage identification in the in this during the COVID, there are a few states like UP and MP that we use their command and control center for the smart city command and control center for locating the uh, COVID patients. And also this they are using the telehealth and telemedicine. So this command and control center, how they can utilize, optimize the usage of this infrastructure for the betterment of the people. Now, you can see on the, this also includes the urban mobility, smart parking, intelligent traffic management, uh, integrated multimodal transport. Governance you can do with the security cameras and everything, the safety and security of the people will be maintained. And this uh, video camera monitoring from a control center, the renewable energy sources, how this rooftop with the increase in rooftop solar, because India is already a 40 gigawatt rooftop solar target. With the rooftop solar, how the energy has been uh, moved with the peer-to-peer -peer that ISGF, is currently working on a peer-to-peer -peer trading for a blockchain. This type of things can also involve the uh, uh, this consumers into a betterment for this. I uh, mean, what you call in the improvement in the uh, production. Also, we call them as a prosumer in the uh, electricity term. Now, uh, on this, uh, you can see there are various uh, smart city solutions. Now, if we come on the smart city solutions that we can use, that is centralized command and control center, which I already told. Uh, mentioned that it is during the COVID that how it is being utilized with the SCADA and GIS and all. Event monitoring, actually, there is event monitoring all the uh, smart systems that are already implemented in the city or in the utilities that are being linked to the one center. That is the command and control center, and you can control it from here. The CCTV surveillance, the smart metering, water, gas, and electricity, how you can leverage the utilities across the electricity uh, sector. But smart systems that we smart applications that we have implemented there can be leveraged for the gas and water sector also, which uh, our president will describe, and our uh, uh, in the next slide in the next presentation. In data analytics center, LED light, LED street lighting, e healthcare, and uh, air monitoring sensor, air quality monitoring sensors. In Calcutta also there is air quality monitoring sensors have been implemented in various cities also there is implemented. That is the emergency response team that on the com uh, command and control center. If events are monitored and that the emergency response team, emergency response center is a uh, system is also there in the command and control center, then emergency response teams can be ready in kind of in, in, in case of any emergency. And then uh, this common card, smart parking system, smart parking system. Hope everybody knows that in some places in Europe mainly, the smart parking system helps you to save a lot of fuel because you don't have to go around to find a, drive, uh, a parking spot. It is already in your app and you can uh, de uh, define the time that you need to be parking. You can find also where the parking spots are available near the area that you are going. So it helps a lot of uh, people to, and it helps also the municipal or the owner of the area to optimize the utilization of the spaces. This is the sum of the barriers that one of the major barrier in India is the governance. That is the three tier governance is there. In India, this three tier governance means you got the First is the national government, then the state government, and the city. Now, if there are various political parties if, uh, are ruling in this government, then that is a mismatch of the decisions or the mismatch of the ideas that they are doing. And this delays actually the implementation of the actual system or the applications and all. The political instability is also there because of this, uh, there is a poor public private participation. 
this public private participation and another major thing is that the clearance the clearance that we need for these projects that for the smart city projects various different projects that are included in the smart city like say, uh, city gas distribution anything the clearance that we needed takes a long long time actually so this delays also the project and increases the cost of the project and that's why very few the 25 percent of the projects have been completed you have seen in the graph also how uh, this uh, very in various states how the projects are being delayed this uh, legal and uh, ethical issues that the issues of openness and data and all that the transparency and like uh, this transparency and openness of data that's the problem in developing countries already and uh, in india you have to file rti to get all the data and all and uh, <clears throat> this environmental lacking ecological view in behavior growing population problem population is already problem that has been discussed the with the increase of more fossil fuels and to cater the energy need we need to move to renewables or the carbon emission effect will increase now we are also moving to EV, also electric vehicle from the because transport in India, I think the 16% contribution to the GHG emission. So here also we are, are doing good in that, reduce the carbon emission effect. The degradation of resources, the economic, the lack of competitiveness, global economic volatility, uh, this higher operational maintenance cost, cost of IT because capacity building of the utilities, which are currently like municipalities and others in the city level, at the city level, this capacity building, need to be done and the skills need to be developed and institutional strengthening needs to be done which is currently lacking on that uh, social side this lack of you know involvement of citizen low awareness level of community geographical diversification problems because in india we have different every people in a city the different types of people are living in a city from different parts of the country so there are lack of uh, this diversity in culture is there so that sometimes also uh, hinders to that because of some of the things that need to be implemented. Lacking, uh, lacking technological knowledge among the planners, lack of access to technology, privacy, privacy and security issues. So in, on the technology side, we have various, we need to do some capacity building that are technical knowledge need to be imparted about the smart systems, how they work, how they execute and what are the, how to solve the problems, how to uh, address if there is any fault to this, uh, the, uh, the main exec executives will be leading those uh, systems and the integration and the convergence issues across the IT networks. So there are various things that need to be done to what you call to accelerate the development of the smart city projects. And uh, for these, we need to take a holistic approach and do the capacity building, need to have a same single window clearance or a very sm uh, smooth process for clearing, for, uh, for getting the clearances. and government should work together on the national state and of uh, city level government previously in various aspects in private sector all in uh, power sector also we have seen like on the, the water uh, river sharing dispute that has led to the delay or the non-development of various hydropower projects because of the disputes with a state subject in india like electricity water and these are all state subjects so there is always if there is a mission from the national government and the government and the party that the political ruling political party at the state and national government national level are different then there is a difference in views and all at least to the delays in the project and uh, the cultural issues that can be sorted by the people themselves because of that and uh, obviously the technology technical know-how needs to be there with the executives to plan those projects and to lead those projects properly so with this i am completing my presentation uh, thank you very much for your kind attention uh, it's over to mr Vasquez. Uh, thank you, Rizhi Saab and Mr. Kundu for the excellent presentations. Uh, we have uh, some questions uh, I just want to ask right away. Uh, the first question is, uh, you have highlighted that uh, energy saving for 2018-19 is around 151.7 MTOE. How do you generally come up with such figure? Is there any way to calculate those things, sir? Uh, actually, this figure has been taken from one of the study carried out by Bureau of Energy Efficiency of India. So they have taken uh, they have most of the programs that have been carried out. It has mentioned here name of the scheme that has been over. Uh, this is the uh, Bureau of Energy Efficiency is managing those uh, or the overarching body who is managing those schemes. And uh, with the schemes that they have, uh, I mean, what do you call with the schemes uh, that are like smart uh, street lighting. So we just 
solar street lighting what they have given or the led light they produce and uh, uh, incandescent fluorescent bulbs so there is always a savings means uh, you can see that this amount of energy is consumed by fluorescent bulb if it is by led so this much amount will be saved right in this way actually we have uh, they have calculated the savings Thank, thank you so much. Hello. Yes, sir. It is up. Yes. That BEE Bureau of Energy Efficiency report was published a week ago, and it's a comprehensive report which uh, talks about what all measures have been done, how annually we are able to save this much of this about twelve billion dollar per year. We are able to save is uh, detailed in that uh, report, which is available on BEE website, Bureau of Energy Efficiency. You can Google, you can get it. If you can't find it, we will be happy to forward it. You could share with all the viewers and other members. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, sir, I would like to put up uh, another question. Uh, only 11% of the work with smart cities uh, among that 100 cities have been completed. What could be the reason for uh, not completed the other 90%, sir? So first of all, it took almost two years for people to prepare a smart city plan. Each one of them had to prepare a smart city plan, submit it to Ministry of uh, Urban Development. Now we call it the Ministry of uh, Urban Development and Housing. So that ministry has a, the, uh, the mission. The mission members will uh, evaluate with the help of consultants. And some of the uh, smart cities took four years to get their smart city plan completed. So uh, that's how, and then funds were allocated to them to do some work and on, on stage by stage, building a gender city is not easy. Uh, with the main thing is that as, as SK had told, my colleague had told in the presentation, there are three tier governance structure here. Actually the city commissioner or the, the, the chairman of the municipality of the city has very little power. So many things are done by central government. For, for example, the railways telecommunication, uh, many things, all the national highways which go through the city or by the side of the city, those are all with the central government or the national government. <coughs> and then comes the, the state government, which is in charge of electricity distribution, state uh, uh, highways, uh, most of the public work department work which happens in the city, these are all done by them. A very little thing is left with the city government. And land acquisition is one of the major problems which we have the old uh, laws which is dating back to the British time still existing. So it, it's not easy to get these projects going. The ones which they have done are also the easy ones. <coughs> Setting up the command and control center. And then many of the places there was a, a extensive amount of public consultation were there. So people were asked what they wanted to in the priority so like some of the places water is the most important uh, item so people give water the uh, top priority water supply should be there in many cities in india you we get only two hour water supply in the morning two hour in the evening so uh, people wanted better water supply so they are working towards that and then uh, some places electricity many places uh, health uh, roads so different uh, sectors were given priority in different states and different regions so these are all the reasons why uh, it, it, in last five years or six years, uh, only 11% or 12% of the work has been done. Some cities have done uh, uh, much better, like in Pune or in Jaipur or in Bhuvanesh or a couple of cities have done much better. Oh, thank, thank you, sir, for the explanations. So I'll put up the third question. Uh, development must be taking place in different cities in parallel. Is there any coordination among cities uh, when such plans are executed? Is there some sort of uh, network where they can learn and share knowledge and experience among each other? Yeah, absolutely. That's a mission. Uh, the Smart Cities mission, which is a, a mission uh, under the Ministry of Housing, uh, Urban Development and Housing. So that it's uh, uh, headed by a person, very senior bureaucrat, who is a joint secretary level person. And who incidentally was the... Uh, Municipal Commissioner in Pune, which was uh, rated as the best smart city plan when they made in 2005, 2000, sorry, 2015, 2016. So another thing they have done, as I said, all the cities had to submit their smart city plan sometime in 2016 or 17. That competition was launched. Everybody had to, uh, accordingly, they were rated. So the, some of them were very much on the uh, behind. Those who were below 50 uh, or those who failed to score below 70 marks out of 100, those who scored below 70 marks, 
the ones which were uh, advanced, those who had more than 80 or 90 marks, those cities were asked to handhold the ones which were poor in performance. So th those kind of networks are there. Then another thing which they have done, they have recruited some young uh, engineers and uh, professionals, young, young professionals for a program. We call it YPP, Young Professionals Program. They are all from the leading uh, uh, engineering colleges and business uh, uh, management schools from around the world. So they were brought on fast track and uh, given training on one full year. They had given training. Some of the people were attached to those who chose to work on the electricity side. They were attached to ISGF also. So those people are now deputed in different cities. So the, the, that framework, smart cities framework, if you look at it in our uh, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, uh, MAWA, we call it, uh, website, you will see all that details. Thank, thank you, sir. Actually, I had uh, another question, but uh, I think you have uh, answered already. The question was, anyway, I'll read. There must be certain there must be certain standard for cities that measures different parameters like housing, waste management, transit, air quality, mobility, etc. Is there if you can briefly explain on how different cities are compared? So I think more or less you have explained, sir. Yeah, but, but there are different standards and these are all being monitored regularly. Mostly the air quality. Uh, the the worst most polluted city in the world used to be Delhi before COVID. So after COVID, <laughs> our our, our uh, uh, air quality has come down. Uh, I mean, it has gone up. Quality is quite good. Uh, the PM 2.5 used to be 400 to 600. In the winter month, it used to go to 600. The safe limit is 25 to 40. Now we are somewhere between 40 and 50 in Delhi these days for the last one month or one and a half months. So uh, noise is another thing which is not being measured anywhere. So there are, there are some framework which is being instituted. We also have a separate uh, panel created under uh, our Bureau of Indian Standard to prepare standards for smart cities, particularly on the communication technology and the other things. So Europe also, since NLEC, uh, they have a joint working group which is preparing standards. Uh, thank you, sir. I'll put up another question, sir. Uh, this is from Nimal here. Are any risks potential for to fail the operation of this uh, completed smart cities? No, I didn't get you. Uh, can you please repeat any? Is there any risk, uh, potential risk to fail the operation of this is completed smart cities? No, there's nothing called a completed. It's a journey. This will continue, uh, con continue. So now if you look at it, when you say Pune smart city, so it's not the entire Pune. We have taken one area of Pune city, uh, that's some 30 square kilometer or something. There they are doing everything. And uh, so some 10, 15 uh, areas there, they are concentrating and doing it. Once it's successfully done there, that will be scaled up to rest of Pune because it's a, a city of several million people. So in their area, you cannot do it just one go. Similar is the case with many other cities, Jaipur or Bhuneshwar or Ranchi or any, any of those places. They have taken some area within the city to experiment all these new uh, systems and which will be scaled up at a later date. That, that, that's a plan. Then in the, uh, the failure, uh, it depends on the technology chosen, the, the uh, level of uh, expertise for the people managing the city and uh, in, in suddenly one or two uh, i think over a dozen places where the city command and control center is functional fully functional today they are using it for the covid monitoring and uh, uh, all the uh, uh, related activities so one of the major threats remains to be cyber security because many of them are going to be online and uh, automated and interconnected so cyber security will be a major uh, issue which is being looked at by the highest authorities and uh, different stakeholders thank you sir sir i'll put up the last questions uh, for this presentation sir. are there any plan to introduce building to grid integration in india as part of the smart city solution yeah the last presentation i will be talking about that yes we, we have been i just have been advocating about the grid interactive building couple of things which we are doing i am I'll, I'll, I'll in the grid interactive buildings and campuses i will be talking in the last presentation uh, thank you so much for clarifying on the question sir so now we'll move forward moving forward we have the 
second presentation of the day by Ms. Rina Suri. Ms. Rina is currently working as executive director with ISGF. She joined the organization in 2013. She brings over 20 years of experience in energy sector. She is responsible for the research projects, advisory services, business development, training and capacity building programs, and customer outreach activities. Ms. Rina has contributed to various advisory services, white paper, and research report on key smart grid domains. She will be presenting on the topic leveraging smart grid asset for smarter cities. With this, uh, I would like to request Madam to go ahead with your presentation. Over to you, Madam. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bhaskar. I'm audible? Yes, Madam. Yes, you are clear. Well, very good morning to all. Um, uh, I'm Reena Suri, work with India Smart Grid Forum, and I'll be presenting on leveraging smart grid assets for smarter cities. And thank you uh, to Smart uh, uh, Sark Energy Center for giving us this opportunity. So we, we, uh, my colleagues have already discussed about um, how uh, uh, you know, energy plays a big role in making the city, our city smarter. And we have seen how cities have evolved over time as places where the entirety of human activities and services concentrate uh, spanning the multiple modes of uh, transportation, water supply, electricity, uh, telecommunication and internet, um, schools and colleges, hospitals, etc. As cities have evolved with the more and more facilities and services, they have become more and more attractive to the people from uh, rural areas leading to faster urbanization. In order to efficiently administer uh, these growing cities, it's very important uh, that the uh, infrastructure service providers and the government uh, use uh, uh, more IT solutions uh, to efficiently manage the services. The cities uh, are referred to as the engines of uh, uh, economic growth. Uh, to ensure that they function as efficient uh, engines, it is critical to our economic development that uh, we plan our growing urban areas as sustainable cities. Uh, as Mr. Bhaskar mentioned in his opening speech, the cities consume uh, more than 80% of the global energy. And therefore, the most important element uh, of, uh, is the electricity uh, distribution sector, which needs to uh, be modernized uh, to necessarily provide the necessary 24 by 7 quality power to all the sectors, which will enable the cities to become uh, more uh, smart and work efficiently and the smart infrastructure can be uh, built up in the city. ISGF, um, I'll just briefly take a, a minute to uh, talk about ISGF. Uh, ISGF, uh, India Smart Grid Forum, is a public-private partnership uh, initiative of Ministry of Power Government of India for accelerated development of uh, smart grid technologies in the Indian power sector. Uh, we have a mandate uh, to advise the government on policies and programs for promotion of smart grids in India, work uh, with international and national uh, agencies uh, in standards development, and uh, we help the utilities, regulators, and the ministries, industry uh, 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 partners in technology selection, training, and capacity building. So, as the advisory body uh, for the various uh, government uh, and ministries, we have uh, we were always been advocating that uh, when uh, the government started planning the smartest uh, smart cities in India, we have, uh, we came out with a white paper uh, talking about how the uh, existing smart grid infrastructure, the IT automated infrastructure, can be leveraged to um, uh, at marginal cost um, uh, make the cities smarter. So our uh, uh, electricity grid, um, uh, you know, uh, our 21st uh, century electricity grid is uh, witnessing se several disruptive uh, changes uh, after 100 years of centralized uh, uh, power generation and creation of massive electricity uh, grids. The shift uh, now is towards the decentralized generation. For the past uh, five years, we are witnessing an increasing share of new generation resources being added at the low voltage and um, or the distribution segment of the grid, which is a major transformational change in the electricity grid. The, uh, the traditional uh, model of uh, our uh, electricity is being generating, uh, gen generating uh, the electricity at the large power, power plant uh, uh, level and uh, it's trans uh, transported to the millions of consumers through long transmission distribution lines. Um, 
now, but but the traditional boundaries between generation, transmission, and distribution are now fast disappearing. But the grid is evolving as an integrated grid, uh, which uh, requires uh, renewable energy to be integrated, which requires uh, the electric uh, vehicles to be integrated. Storage has to be part of it. Uh, uh, so it's becoming a more complex uh, grid uh, to manage uh, on the whole. So I talked about smart grid. Uh, so what is uh, smart grid? Smart grid is the electricity grid with communication, automation, IT systems that enables the real-time monitoring and control of bi-directional power flows and information uh, flows from points of uh, generation to points of consumption. At the appliances level, it integrates all types of uh, gen uh, power generation resources and helps the consumer become a producer or a consumer, as uh, Sudha Sata mentioned in his uh, uh, presentation. So these are some of the typical components uh, which uh, uh, you know, make the grid smarter. We have the electrical uh, network uh, uh, strengthening uh, that is required at the 33 kV and 11 kV and, uh, levels. CADA, DMS, and distribution automation systems have to be in place. We uh, ideally have, we should have uh, the overhead lines uh, uh, to be underground, uh, uh, put into underground uh, locations, and uh, the distributed in a, a renewable generation and its integration uh, with electricity grid uh, is uh, a key component of a smart grid. Uh, we, uh, for uh, far uh, places or islands, uh, we can have smart microgrids. Uh, uh, and we can manage them very well if our grid is smart enough to manage uh, that. And we can also draw power back if um, uh, you know our grid can uh, is connected and can uh, manage that. So conservation of air insulated uh, substations to gas insulated substations, AMI communication systems, uh, uh, efficient uh, billing CRM and consumer portal, uh, 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 enterprise resource planning system. So these are some of the components that are very essential uh, for uh, uh, making the grid uh, smart. So what is it that we desire uh, for our, what are the desired features of our uh, smart city? We, we have to have uh, uh, 24 by seven stable electricity to uh, be given to the citizens to be able to manage all the smartness that we are trying to bring around us in our system. We have to build a GIS data of uh, all the infrastructure and services in an integrated fashion by uh, the designated agency or uh, we should have the, with the rules and security integrated into the system. High levels of uh, renewable energy mix are uh, integrated with the power grid for making sure future cities uh, sustainable. Electric vehicle uh, is also, um, uh, uh, you know, as we are talking about it and it's the future uh, uh, of the mobility that uh, Mr. Pillay will also be talking about. So we have to have, uh, uh, you know, our cities have to be prepared to, with the electric vehicle charging infrastructure and the ability to operate uh, the large fleets uh, of uh, grid connected electric vehicles uh, in, in the system. And they can also be uh, used as a virtual power plant when the system needs, uh, the grid needs power back. The vehicles can also supply uh, power back to uh, the grid. So efficient, um, uh, apart from power, we have to have efficient uh, uh, water distribution network uh, with the leakage detection uh, systems. Uh, uh, safe uh, gas distribution network should be there. Integrated billing system for uh, a variety of services um, uh, can be planned with the, the way we have now that we are planning our cities to be smarter. So why not have one billing system uh, to integrate all the various services uh, and uh, pay at one go for all? We can have common uh, consumer case centers. I'll be talking more uh, de in detail as to how the electricity, the smart grid uh, infrastructure can be leveraged uh, to uh, be able to manage these uh, uh, services uh, without recreating the whole system again. We have to have intelligent uh, transport system with uh, traffic lights, uh, coordinated operation of traffic lights, alerts of on congested routes on in advanced uh, common paths for toll payments, etc. Digital security system, which is also a very important aspect of a, uh, uh, any city, and uh, with emergency services um, uh, integrated into the system. 
uh, electrification of uh, mobility with the fleet operators i just talked about that uh, intelligent buildings with the uh, rooftop uh, pv and electric vehicle charging uh, facilities so this is this is the kind of future we are looking at and uh, so you know what kind of infrastructure that will be required and what kind of uh, uh, um, uh, support or uh, uh, integration we will have to require to be able to manage uh, all these uh, systems together so as we talked about uh, you know what is the business case for having uh, uh, smart cities and uh, what is uh, that uh, you know smart grids how smart grids can play a key role in uh, that so there are uh, uh, you know two categories of cities we are looking at there are the existing cities uh, um, and there are uh, new cities that are being planned and um, um, there's no single ownership we look at uh, the cities uh, all the services are with different agencies different stakeholders managing it so bringing it together uh, into one uh, uh, system it's it's a hercules task to integrate actually the all the uh, platforms together and uh, these projects are quite complex and um, uh, difficult to justify the return on investment um, uh, for the systems that will be required for various uh, domains uh, of uh, smart cities so we talk about uh, uh, business case for smart grid uh, business case uh, for smart grid from uh, efficiency improvements is a viable option and uh, once the smart grid infrastructure is in place it's easier to extend it to cover other domains and uh, services to build the smart cities um, uh, uh, and uh, that can be achieved at a marginal cost and uh, preliminary studies by sgf uh, also show that uh, you know if we have an efficient system we can easily uh, 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 bring the the losses that the distribution sector is uh, facing uh, uh, to as low as 10% and the payback uh, of uh, uh, investment in the the sector is uh, 3 to 4 years only and it's possible to extend all the digital platforms that are being created uh, by electricity sector to uh, gas water internet and security traffic the telecom uh, sector also i'll i'll be talking about that uh, in my future future slides in detail so uh, digitalization of power sector that uh, you know we have uh, all our electrical uh, assets mapped on uh, uh, under various uh, uh, schemes in different countries uh, they have uh, Uh, try to map all the digital uh, the assets uh, of uh, electricity sector medium voltage low voltage lines etc and the consumers on a digital map and the utilities update this system on a regular basis to capture the new additions the changes that are being made uh, addition of uh, consumers or the building and these digital maps are efficiently used uh, uh, can also be efficiently used for other infrastructure service providers for planning and operating their mills like uh, if we talk about uh, in india we are now uh, government is uh, 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 has a very ambitious plan to have uh, gas pipelines for most of the consumers uh, in various states so uh, instead of recreating the, the uh, uh, and digitalizing the gas customers again uh, onto a gis map the existing gis map of the power utility can easily be leveraged to Uh, uh plan b um, uh, and they don't have to recreate uh, their map to be able to map the consumers because it's, it's on common and same for uh, telecom and um, uh, water supply uh, sewage uh, lines all can be mapped on the same uh, gis map and that can be utilized talking about uh, automation systems um, uh, power sector we have the automation systems like scada dms uh, da ds uh, dams so these field infrastructures and dedicated communication uh, bandwidth of automated uh, systems can be easily shared with other infrastructure domains uh, the latest trend uh, in is uh, the utilities uh, building their own communication network so uh, uh, what are the market opportunities with the existing uh, automated systems of power uh, uh they can be uh, common scada can be leveraged for water and distribution utilities uh, the communication infrastructure can be shared with the security traffic cameras and other smart city uh, applications the communication uh, network can be 
uh, leads to the telecom operators uh, for uh, their connection uh, with the customer. Moving forward, uh, uh, we, we, have, uh, we talk about the billing and customer relationship management. Uh, the power uh, companies have uh, implemented uh, these uh, systems for most of their consumers and uh, uh, in, in most of their operation areas. And uh, uh, the, uh, have, they have the multiple options uh, for making the payments, uh, be it uh, on their portal or coming to the consumer care center. Uh, the distri uh, distribution companies uh, uh, have regular interaction with the consumers, like uh, they send the meter reader or uh, meter reading is done, billing distribution, uh, bill distribution, payment selection. All these services can be common uh, for uh, you know using the water and the gas bill, house taxes, or the municipal dues can also be uh, collected at the same uh, time. And um, uh, this uh, this uh, setup can also be uh, extended uh, to the cable TV, internet, or tele telephone operator. Now, this is not only to re will reduce the overall collection cost, but also facilitate higher compliance and timely payment. Uh, if the consumer wishes, uh, he can opt for a consolidated bill, or uh, uh, you know, instead of uh, uh, managing different deadlines or different uh, payment uh, modes, we they just have to uh, uh, make the payment at uh, one go at one click. Again, uh, uh, talking about the billing and uh, customer care, uh, we can have common customer care uh, centers uh, with one uh, number to call for all the services. Uh, and uh, uh, our customer care centers now are uh, uh, fully equipped with uh, the moving forward. The distribution companies are also introducing chat bots, voice bots uh, into the system. So overall, this infrastructure is um, uh, available uh, for uh, managing the other uh, uh, domains as well. And uh, also, these, you know, they can be uh, shared on a revenue share uh, basis uh, with the other uh, um, uh, domain holders. They don't have to reinvest in the uh, assets. They can use this uh, on a, at a, with a small payment to the distribution uh, company. And uh, analytics of this data from the customer uh, calls, interactions, and chatbots, uh, they can also be used for business operations of the other uh, uh, stakeholders. And uh, the call centers uh, can be made uh, city command and control centers at a marginal cost for the other uh, sectors as well. So I, I talked about the uh, different uh, automation automation uh, uh, systems, uh, talking about routing management system. So this also can be common for uh, gas and water uh, agencies, and they can leverage the same infrastructure and better manage their system. So summarizing my presentation, uh, 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 Smart Grid is an anchor infrastructure for smart cities to accelerate the development of livable, workable, and sustainable ecosystem in the SAF cities. And uh, renewable energy uh, will be a key uh, 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 point for uh, making the cities carbon neutral uh, and sustainable in the future. Uh, we can have a standard framework for smart cities that will help understand the interdependencies of various uh, domains and better planning. And we've also been talking about having a smart city maturity model that would map and benchmark uh, various uh, domains in the city and uh, offer a framework to develop the roadmap for transformation from analysis to to be state uh, in a phased manner. And uh, finally, uh, you know, the concept of smart city is uh, gaining popularity. We know that uh, um, it's coming and um, our government uh, wants our cities to be smarter as uh, uh, the whole uh, the consumers are becoming smarter and our systems and appliances are becoming smarter. But the challenge becomes how to start the process and uh, uh, coordinate the whole process with the different stakeholders involved. So instead of treating this as a, an, as a standalone project or an IT project, it uh, really makes sense to anchor this uh, around the energy and power and um, uh, leverage the existing uh, distribution uh, assets or the smart grid assets that we have to build uh, our uh, cities uh, and make them smarter. I think the, uh, that's all from my side. Uh, I'll be happy to take the questions. Thank you so much. Over to you, Mr. Bhaskar. 
thank you, Mr. Rina, for your wonderful presentation on leveraging smart grid asset for smarter cities. We have some questions and I would like to ask uh, to you, madam. Uh, well, it is always convenient to have at least common monthly bill for electricity, communications, gas, water, etc. Any countries in the SARC already implemented this scheme? Uh, if not, uh, how long do you see this coming in our region? So we really, uh, you know, uh, talking about, uh, sorry, uh, Regisa, you say something? You want me to answer that or you? Yes, sir, please, because uh, we have really not done our uh, bit of study to really understand uh, how the other SARC countries are planning uh, to leverage the smart grid assets or uh, making uh, their roadmap for smart cities. So uh, globally, if you look at it, uh, Mr. Basker, uh, in mm -hmm. Western Europe and North America, electricity and gas is distributed by the same company. So they have common billing systems. Uh, when it comes to Middle East, uh, water and electricity are distributed by the same companies. They have common billing systems and platforms. But when it comes to India uh, or, or the SARC countries, we were the first one to advocate uh, this uh, concept uh, that two, three, four years ago. So what we could do was that we uh, now opened our ISGF membership to city gas distribution companies. Also, we made uh, uh, we made an, a marriage between Tata Power Delhi distribution company, which manages electricity distribution in one third of Delhi. And also with the Indraprastha Gas Limited, which is a, again a government owned uh, gas distribution company operational in uh, Delhi. So in one housing colony or one, one uh, division uh, in the Northwest Delhi, in 2018, they signed an agreement. And from 2019 onwards, they, uh, October or November, they started uh, making a common uh, billing system for a couple of co housing colonies in one division. So they are, uh, uh, unfortunately, this all comes under a different regulatory regime. For electricity, we have a electric, Delhi Electricity Regulatory Commission, whereas city gas distribution for the entire Delhi, sorry, entire India, we have one PNGRB, Petroleum and Natural Gas uh, Regulation Body. So they have a different billing cycle. Once in two months, they do electricity, we do every month. So we are trying to get over this. We have been, ISGF have been organizing common meetings between this uh, uh, set of operators, city gas uh, operators. So, uh, and next will be the common, uh, uh, the compliance center. So in India, we now have one number, which is four digit number 1912, which is common all across India for electricity compliance. So the same, uh, uh, the, the, the compliance center, we will expand it to uh, gas and water and other people. So first we are trying to do gas because city gas distribution companies are very well professionally managed. Uh, some of them government, some of them uh, private, but still they are much better managed. When come to water, these are all managed by the municipality. So it's very difficult to uh, deal with them because they are uh, not, not well organized. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I'll put up another question. Uh, uh, in the presentation, Madam has uh, highlighted that uh, high level renewable energy mix uh, isn't it uh, endangering the grid stability? How it is managed in India? Well, uh, di digitalization is the key. So, uh, we, we, we have done many things on uh, uh, grid integration of renewable energy. Uh, we have built a dedicated uh, 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 high voltage transmission lines uh, with uh, uh, connecting large solar power and wind farms with the big polling stations in the uh, nearby regions and those are uh, dedicated transmission corridors we built uh, so this uh, this uh, solar farm 500 megawatt or uh, 500 megawatt kind of large connected to a voltage uh, transmission network which is managing thousands of watts so this is something which we have done this is one big corridor which is 400 kv and 765 kv lines which connect the entire national grid which will be able to uh, accommodate some minor variations another thing which we have recently done is to have renewable energy monitoring centers these are being set up in uh, 
seven states and also in three regions, northern, western, and southern regions. Uh, we have regional load dispatch centers, and also uh, I, there is a national load dispatch center, which is our national control center. So all these places, we have put new systems. So what this renewable energy monitoring center does, we do it uh, two day ahead forecasting, a day ahead forecasting, and intra day uh, mitigation measures. So all these centers are equipped with. Uh, very sophisticated tools for weather forecasting and also generation and uh, demand forecasting. So these are some of the systems which have been done. These are uh, one of the best in the world actually because we have just done it now. Uh, three or three uh, regional load dispatch, uh, sorry, uh, renewable energy monitoring center or REMCs have been commissioned. MLDC uh, uh, REMC is com commissioned. And uh, out of seven, three or four states, we have commissioned. Most states will add these things uh, later. So uh, very, very sophisticated systems are there for weather forecasting and uh, demand and uh, dispatch. So they give uh, intraday mitigation measures for that. So when it comes to the distribution level, that is 32 kV, 22 kV, and 11 kV lines. Uh, so there, we still have only about 5,000 megawatt of uh, solar connected in those voltage levels, a little over 5,000 megawatt. Uh, out of the 87,000 megawatt of uh, solar and wind, which we talked about, uh, uh, this is going to rapidly increase to 40,000 megawatt. So we have been, uh, ISGF undertook a detailed study last year. We published a energy storage roadmap for India. So we uh, expect to, uh, we propose some, uh, that document also, you can see it on the ISGF website. Uh, we proposed about 10 gigawatt of, 10 gigawatt hour of energy storage by 2022 for integration of 40,000 megawatt of rooftop PV onto the grid and the total about 170 gigawatt hour by 2032. Uh, by then we will have 450 gigawatt of uh, renewable energy. So this energy storage which we recommended uh, at different voltage levels, that's a very comprehensive study which you have done. And uh, another very important uh, fact we like to bring to your attention, on 5th of April, our Prime Minister had uh, told all the Indians to switch off the light at 9 p.m. So 9 p.m. on 5th of April, all the Indians switched off their light and many other appliances. And they, they were asked to come out of their house or stand in the balcony and uh, light candles or dias. So this everybody had done. And uh, our, our power system operators have grossly underestimated that the total lighting load in India, now everybody uses LED all, all across the country. So our lighting load, they underestimated to be 13,000 megawatts. But in actual people, other than light, they switched off other appliances also. So as a result, it went up to 32,000 megawatt was the change in the load. So 847 to 909, the load came down by 32,000 megawatt, which was almost 25-30% uh, of that load. Because these days our total load is only about, because of COVID, all the commercial centers and all the factories are closed. Our load is somewhere around 125,000 megawatts. So out of that, this has come down to by 32,000 megawatt. The, there was no disruption in the grid. The, the frequency was maintained within the prescribed band. Uh, voltage drops were not observed anywhere. So this was very brilliantly done. This all possible because of the digitalization, the amount of digitalization which uh, the Indian grid has undergone in the last 10 years. Over to you, Bhaskar. Over to you, Mr. Bhaskar. Thank you so much, sir, for explaining us in detail. Uh, even I was uh, very curious to know what would happen with that nine minutes uh, start, uh, putting off the lights. So it has, uh, India has done commendable work on that, I would say. Uh, the next question is from Bhutan, uh, is Phunso uh, Dorji. Uh, his question is, uh, is there any EV charging infrastructure in India? How to build an efficient EV charging infrastructure? Well, uh, EV charging uh, is a, 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 like in a, every other place, it's a chicken egg situation. Uh, people will not uh, deploy charging stations unless there is a demand. So all across India today, we may have about 800 to 1,000 charging stations in different places. So uh, but the actual load is very less. Uh, the public charging station uh, is used by cars. We have about 2 million uh, 
electric rickshaws which are mainly 99% of them are still on lead acid batteries which take several hours to charge those are all charged in different uh, hubs there are operators who are giving them charging services uh, it takes a couple of hours uh, they charge it so that's the main ev load as we speak we have about 11000 car most of these cars are imported from china in uh, semi knockdown condition or fully knockdown condition and assembled in india so they follow the chinese standard so the, the existing charging stations which we set up in different places majority of them are uh, the same chinese gbt standard in india we call it as bharat ev charging standard with uh, or EV, bharat ev charging specifications under the bureau of indian standard in 2016 isgf made a, a, a representation that they should set up a committee to prepare standard for electric vehicle charging so 2017 onwards we have a committee uh, the first set of standards which we have issued is in 2018 it is called is 17017 part 1 there are two more standards we have issued part 23 24 uh, and I, is, is iso 15118 series of standards six documents so these are all issued in 2018 2019 we still have another five six standards to be issued which we will do this year which is more about uh, communication between the ev and the grid communication between the customer and the grid is sold uh, sorry and the ev is already captured in that iso 15118 series of standards uh connectors and pins etc this we will expect to complete by another three to six three to six months so uh actually in the the main standard is 17017 we had gone for uh everything we follow iec standard in india electricity we follow iec standard by and large every, everywhere so we wanted to follow iec which is combined charging uh, system ccs so ccs2 we adopted as the standard and then government of india invited automobile manufacturers to come and set up car manufacturing facilities in india as i said some of the indian companies who are making car they are importing from china as we speak so the, 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 the interestingly it's only the japanese and the koreans they came forward to set up electric vehicle manufacturing facility we have the suzuki they are making car which will be launched sometime later this year we have uh, uh, hyundai which is already launched their kona uh, suv electric last year so th these are uh, both of them japanese and koreans they follow shadow stand standard for uh, dc charging so we allowed in the 17017 standard we allowed uh, CCS and Shadamo to coexist, and as well as we have this uh, GBT standard in the name of barrel charging uh, specifications. So, all the standards are uh, going to be followed in India, and uh, we will now recently under a program called Faster uh, Manufacturing of Electric Vehicles, uh, if we call it FAME, FAME, FAME 2 program, 2650. Uh, public charging stations were given allotted by ministry of heavy industries they are giving uh, some some amount of uh, uh, money uh, subsidy subsidy for the charging stations which will be set up all across the country so uh, that that's a situation about the uh, uh, charging standards as well as charging stations so public charging stations we have done a thorough study and 2019-18 we published a white paper which is also available on isgf white uh, website it's called ev charging uh, business models for ev charging stations so we found out that there is very little money for private operators to make from ev charging in many places uh, uh, the, the actual grid charge multiplied by three to four times is what in europe and america they are charging the private operators and also in many other places the government has given uh, subsidies to be uh, the charging station operators to set up uh, charging stations uh, and for the public transportation the buses chargers will be set up in the bus depots of the transport operators they will never go to a private place to charge this is the scenario thank you so much uh, Ms. Rina and Rajesh for answering the questions uh, now we'll move to the next presentation uh, it is on uh, sustainable mobility solutions for smart cities of the future so by mr Rizik kumar pillai you may go ahead with your presentation sir yeah uh, 
uh, good afternoon and uh, thanks so come to the this, this actually this is uh, some of the slides from a bigger deck uh, is, is what uh, I will be presenting so smarter infrastructure this is a bigger presentation some other time when we have time we'll be happy to take you through it's about uh, three four hours of uh, deck but I'll be presenting from here only about energy efficiency, emission free or clean uh, uh, electricity generation, smart mobility, and lastly about the in, instrumented, interconnected, and intelligent uh, infrastructure. The rest of them I'll leave it for the time being. So come to the uh, next slide. <clears throat> the bigger challenge is uh, when we talk about uh, smarter infrastructure or smart cities. How do we build things which will last centuries? How to design roads, buildings, and other infrastructure that can last several centuries, if not millenniums? Many of our 20th century buildings and infrastructure, they collapse in a small earthquake or in a, a cyclone. But look at some of the monuments which are existing in the world, which are thousands of years old temples and palaces in India. They are still there. Taj Mahal is 400 years old. It's still there. Though there were no concrete, there were no reinforcement steel those days. But Taj Mahal still stands. And uh, uh, look at the Kutub Minar, which is in Delhi, which is almost uh, 900 years old. All these things are there. Such examples are there in every part of the world. Many things which our uh, for ancient forefathers made, they all still stand. They weathered all the storms and earthquakes and all other natural calamities and continues whereas our modern building technologies are not able to stand even a uh, average earthquake so here is where what are the, the the needs of today may not serve good for after a few decades or a century uh, one of the very classic example here is about the transport scenario in the 1880 1890 time frame that decayed in london the traffic speed had come down to four or five kilometers per hour. What was the transport available those days? It was only horse carriages. The horse carriages or every middle class could, after industrial revolution, even the middle class could afford horse carriages. The speed of uh, uh, traffic in London had come down to very poor four or five kilometers per hour. So a lot of brainstorming used to happen among the university professors and the city planners and all of them, how we can improve it so one way road and all these things been still being debated but when the automobiles came the traffic speed increased and the whole the horses disappeared same thing with uh, manhattan in the new york city the manhattan alone had close to 400,000 horses one of the biggest worry of the city planner there used to be how to get food for this 400,000 old horses and how to clean their urine and their manure so the roads in Manhattan were much wider, so traffic was not still a bigger problem. But 1880, 1890, if you look at the pictures of New York City, you will see only horse carriages. Ten years down the line, it is difficult to spot even one horse. It is all automobiles. But 100 years down the line, in, in 2020, when you look at it, the traffic speed in London is back to the same four kilometer, five kilometer. People prefer to walk than going by taxi or car. So same is the case with uh, New York. The traffic speed is so slow. At times, it takes hours. People stuck on the road. So what are the solutions which we found for the mobility? Uh, so what are the planning tools which are available with us today for designing the infrastructure that will last centuries? And support the needs of the new type of jobs. The 50% of the jobs which we do today were not there in 40 years ago or 30 years ago. And 50% of the job which we today may not be there in 2050. So if you are looking at building smart cities of the future, we have to look at how efficient, uh, how, how those things are go not going to be obsolete. And many things are going to be different right now after the post uh, post covid life is not going to be the same again many things will change so next slide please yeah 
so a typical building in north america today consume about 400 kilowatt hour per square meter in india also most of the buildings consume more than 200 kilowatt hour per square meter but present day technology and the material which are available for building construction can bring this down as low as 50 kilowatt hour per square meter per year which which with, with cooling with heating we can achieve this today but building codes are not talking about this even uh, the lead certified uh, buildings they don't specify any minimum uh, energy consumption for giving a gold or a platinum rating so we have been advocating uh, when the smart cities program came also we have been advocating that all buildings in india should be mandatorily should be, be below 100 kilowatt hour per square meter otherwise don't give them permission to construct so well people are still debating it has not happened yet and similarly large campuses and to be com converted into smart microgrid that can island from the main grid when required so this is something again our our, our white paper was the beginning 2014 we had a white paper on large uh, grid interactive microgrids and campuses where buildings and campuses can become uh, uh, microgrids and it can interact with the grid i'll talk in detail about that a while later so uh, <coughs> similarly dc distribution system uh, in parallel with the uh, existing ac distribution system uh, many hotels you today find even in planes and in hotels you find a, a, a usb port where you can actually charge your mobile phone those are 5 volt but 48 volt can take care of most of your need today including lighting including fan including uh, your laptops most of the things can be done and we are currently writing standard for 48 volt dc uh, distribution system in india lvdc or low voltage dc system in IIT, we ISDM worked with IIT Madras. IIT Madras, there are two buildings which are completely on 48 volt DC. Uh, DC. And uh, this is something which uh, we could work energy efficiency. We talked about energy efficiency, but this can be achieved only through uh, stricter measures, stricter uh, uh, policy intervention only. Otherwise, uh, people will still continue to buy. Uh, by and large, now we don't find a locally assembled AC some 20 years ago when the air conditioners in india used to cost 40 50000 rupees locally assembled acs people used to buy which used to be only 15000 18000 rupees but the, in one year you will pay another 20000 rupees on the electricity extra electricity it consumes now all the acs have three star four star and five star ratings 99% of the acs which people buy today are star rated ac that is another reason how electricity consumption has come down then the lift lifts are being regenerative uh, lift that technology is also matured Come to that next uh, slide, please. So energy efficient buildings, uh, commercial buildings, uh, all of them can, as I said, can be well below 100 kilowatt hour per uh, year per square meter. And the latest trend is net zero emission buildings, which is being built in many parts of the world. Net, net zero emission buildings with several technologies. So, and how do we make energy sector emission free? The zero emission buildings or zero emission campuses, lead and Griha certified buildings. The peer is another, many of you know about the leadership energy efficiency and design. Lead is done by US building, US Green Building Council, US GBC. They are the one which are doing this gold, silver, gold, and platinum certification across the world. In India, we have Theri, which do a something equivalent to that. It's called Griha, which is a more Indian context uh, certifications, which uh, the Energy and Resources Institute, Theri, do that. The same USGBC came out with a different model for PEER. Uh, this is uh, a, a, another certification, which again, they worked with us. USGBC is a member of ISGF, and they worked with us in 2016-17 to launch this in India because uh, the campuses how do you rate a campus or a town on electricity distribution when they first de develop this framework peer framework in america and all the cities there they have electricity 24 7 electricity supply for several years so it is ir irrelevant for that so peer is more relevant for 
developing countries. So they wanted to test it. So they came uh, when many utilities in US and Europe, they said this is not relevant, there's no need for it. Then they came to ISGF and we took them to Tata Power Delhi distribution. So we uh, it took a couple of campuses there, so societies there, and we tried that. And PIR has been uh, finally a certified system. It was launched in 2018. <coughs> Several campuses have been done. Now you can benchmark whether you want to live in a city with a better electricity supply or uh, uh, who are certified higher on peer rating, or you want to go to a place where, uh, like in Delhi, if I want to move to Gurugam versus Faridabad versus Ghaziabad the, on the suburbs, I will first see where the electricity supply is better and then accordingly, I will take a decision. <coughs> Another way of reducing pollution is the electric vehicle only zones. This is something which we have been advocating. Some of the areas, there could be only electric vehicles allowed. Some of the city centers, some of the uh, pilgrimage places, some of the tourist centers, etc. And later, you, you can expand that. For example, in Delhi, Quran Place is only electric vehicle entry, only permitted. Then uh, people will take a electric taxi. If I don't have an electric vehicle, I take an electric taxi and go to Quran uh, Place. So that will happen only through policy intervention. We have been talking about it, uh, it to happen. But in like in 20 years ago, uh, Taj Mahal, you cannot go f within two kilometers of Taj Mahal on your regular vehicle. You have to go on uh, electric uh, rickshaws which are running there. So <clears throat> this thing we expect to happen in more places. Walk to work is uh, another uh, concept, walk, walk to work neighborhoods. So that's the way the new uh, smart cities need to be designed. People have been talking about that. And uh, dust free constru construction, this is one of the major problem in India and in many developing countries. So you build a road and you leave some space between the building. So that area between the, the asphalted road and the building on the side, there is some area with maybe two meter, it may be five meter, that is all mud and uh, dirt. But when you look at developed countries, you will see no such area given like that. If at all it is there, it is either pavement or it is uh, either grass. It, there is no uh, dust, it comes there. Similarly, uh, buildings are also built dust free. And we have, uh, in our white paper, one of them we have recommended that all EV charging, all new buildings of a certain size should have mandatory EV charging uh, infrastructure. So when you build a new building, you put the parking lots, at least half of the parking lot or 30% of the parking lot, if you build uh, EV charging station, that is not going to increase even 1% of the cost, 0.01% of the total cost of the new building. But in an existing building, when you want to build this, people will see who is going to pay. It's going to be millions of dollars investment, who is going to do that. So that question will not be there. This was immediately, uh, within one month of our publishing the white paper, uh, our Ministry of uh, Urban Development, they have issued uh, notices that uh, they made a change in the building code that all new buildings will have 30% of the uh, parking lots uh, equipped with the EV charging. Similarly, uh, higher share of clean clean energy, solar, wind, wave, geothermal, ocean thermal energy conversion, and also waste to energy plants. Waste to energy is something which uh, we must uh, look at it uh, very seriously. Uh, I have seen uh, new technologies and systems emerging in China. They have got it very right. <clears throat> no need for segregation of the waste. Everything goes into the waste to energy plant and they burn everything in and build a, 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 a electricity. So this is something which all the cities uh, in SARC need to look at seriously. And also they have uh, said that the electricity from the waste to energy plant, the, the uh, regulators have allowed that to be charged more, 50% more than the electricity from the grid, the regular grid. Suppose the electricity in the city of Delhi, if our distribution companies are building uh, are buying electricity from the thermal and the other generators at five rupees per kilowatt hour. The, from the waste to energy, it can be seven and a half rupees per kilowatt hour. That's a China uh, uh, system, 50% more. But it is not going to increase my power bill drastically because waste to energy, total electricity supply to Delhi, if we have plants, it's not going to be even 1% or 2% of the total millions of units of electricity consumed in a day. So it will have a very marginal impact on the customer tariff, but we need to support them through tariff systems. 
and we already talked about the smart grids, uh, microgrids, and energy storage systems. In the next slides, we will talk about the grid interactive campuses and buildings. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, uh, the, the, the changing uh, electricity landscape, coal plant to solar and wind farms. A coal plant can be uh, take three to five years to build, and uh, whereas a solar and wind farm can be done in 12 to 18 months. Uh, that's a major uh, change. We can build these things in uh, much faster. And uh, also integration of this is possible, which uh, we already mentioned. Next, next slide, please. Microgrid, grid interactive buildings and campuses. So what is in a microgrid? It's a self generation, uh, solar PV, wind, fuel cells, gas turbine, DG set, all this within the campus, within a microgrid need to have some self generation, some energy storage systems and load control. You should be able to remotely control the load and also vehicle to grid integration. So car batteries has virtual power plant offering vehicle to grid services and an islanding feature. We covers uh, price arbitrage we could do buy more from the grid when the price is less and sell back to the grid when uh, prices are higher that is something which this uh, uh, grid interactive buildings can do and they can leverage the electric vehicles which are parked in this uh, campuses and buildings as the, uh, the battery of those as the storage devices and also biggest uh, security of uh, microgrid in a system is against the cyber attacks and weather events we have seen in uh, us and europe particularly us when there are major cyclones or uh, uh, happens many areas many cities go without electricity for several days uh, because they never had dg sets because they have always had uh, reliable electricity supply those are all changing now so these are all, all the in a microgrid scenario we will be able to give electricity uh, from the local generation and the storage to the most essential systems. If you put uh, water supply, storage, and uh, your uh, communication systems, uh, etc., uh, as the most essential things that can be uh, serviced for a couple of uh, days, a couple of weeks, or, or a couple of days. And uh, cooling and the heating, those are the loads which are not so important, can be uh, given lesser priority. Previous slide, please. Yeah, so so uh, islanding feature is very important in a microgrid. You, you just look at your laptops. Laptops ha doesn't have a in, internal uh, generation, uh, power generation capability, but it has uh, everything else which is written here. It has energy store, it has a battery, it works when connected to the, the the socket also. It will work when, when it is the plug out of it also. It has some certain loads which can be controlled. There's an energy, a energy management system in the laptop which uh, immediately the moment you pull out from the plug it, 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 it will immediately dim the, the brightness of the screen or a couple of other functions which are not required so the microgrid uh, in a way work in a much bigger way and grid interactive buildings will have the building management systems which will uh, interact with the distribution management system of the electric utility here we have huge problem because none of the bms vendors have any standard everything is proprietary this is an area which we have been interacting with a couple of people like Honeywell etc on the building management side how they can uh, interact with the distribution management system uh, which are uh, standard based now and rooftop PV and uh, EV charging infrastructures in integrated and uh, buying and selling of electricity from the market and also peer-to-peer -peer selling in real time on blockchain smart contracts on blockchain and smart appliances, the grid interactive appliances, you should be able to program your appliances to buy electricity from the cheapest resource in real time. Uh, one example I like to give, which is of the refrigerator. Your refrigerator, when it goes on the defrost cycle, it takes more electricity to defrost than the compressor, which takes to cool. So, and today, billions of refrigerators connected to the grid around the world, they many of them, or most of them, uh, defrost on its own uh, setting which happens at the peak hour no need for that to happen when it becomes grid interactive it, it becomes smarter uh, refrigerator it could uh, uh, defrost when the electricity is cheaper and such all such smart contract can be executed on uh, blockchain next slide please 
now I come to the smart mobility. Transport is the transport is the area where there is a lot of uh, hissing sound coming. Yeah, I, I hope everybody can hear me well. Yes, sir. We can hear you now, sir. Okay. So, how are we on time? Are, are we, I'll take another ten minutes to complete this. If you have time, uh, we'll go slow. Otherwise, I'll go fast. So, uh, while designing cities, and uh, we should see that the minimum commute for daily needs: walk to work, or walk to school, walk to shopping, walking to or cycling to recreation is something which I already mentioned. Long escalators and ways where they are cost effective instead of driving cars everybody these are also being experimented in different places electric vehicle friendly infrastructure we talked about it already and autonomous vehicle friendly infrastructure what is autonomous vehicle vehicles are going to be driverless in the near future uh, very soon it's, these are all going to be driverless so uh, the infrastructure which we are planning for future has to be promoting that promoting shared mobility so th there's only uh, one city in the world where 100 percent bus service is electric shenzhen shenzhen achieved this uh, in december 2016 uh, about 16,000 vehicles have become i mean buses has, uh, public buses have become electric there I, I visited shenzhen in april 2018 in one year after the vehicle which has gone in 2017 uh, one full year they have run electric buses 38,000 people they have abandoned their car for going to work so so much of congestion in the city has come down it is so convenient for people to take a electric bus sit there do their work or read and get down at the uh, at your destination go to work fresh because electric buses are noiseless vibrationless so you have completely fatigueless travel rather than driving your own car and fighting with other vehicles for every inch of road space so this is something which has happened and that example is being recreated people been advocating for shared mobility on uh, shared taxis and three wheelers and electric buses so delivery drones are already been done passenger drones have been given uh, uh, trial licenses in different cities so the future we will see in the buildings drone parts which will come for <clears throat> delivering you things and covid is only going to increase or, or, or fasten the implementation or, or the rollout of drones for a variety of services so people will be going on uh, the, 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 the passenger drones and future navigation systems for drones need to be there in the future cities a, a kind of atc today we have atc's why planes go on a particular route is because they go on place the land where uh, always connected to an atc so the drones also need to be uh, controlled through some kind of a land device uh, monitoring centers which will uh, which will avoid collisions so those kind of a charging infra for drones when a drone comes to uh, deliver something on your or a passenger on your drone pad like the helipad you will have the instead of a car parking uh, every flight will have a drone pad in the future and uh, in many buildings lift will be number of lift will be much less because you will not be going to the ground floor get down from it drone take a lift and go to the 20th floor or 30th floor you will be arriving at the drone part of that that floor itself so that is going to be the uh, future and at the same time there are vertical take of vehicle uh, the infrastructure has to be uh, good for that so the car which will be driving on the highways at some places that that uh, side of the runway become a fly uh, sorry side of the highway will become a runway from there you take off go fly for next 200 or 500 kilometer land on the high, highway by the side there is a runway and then again fold the wings and uh, drive into the city center so this kind of things are going to be uh, the reality in uh, five to ten years so in the next couple of slides we will show some pictures of these things and particularly passenger drones are going to be all app based you don't need a pilot this the app will drive that show the next uh, slides Yeah, this uh, talk about a transit elevated bus which will go uh, over the other uh, regular city traffic in a city and uh, uh, hybrid or the flying cars helicopter or the uh, kind of passenger drones and uh, delivery drones these are all being uh, commercialized at a faster pace next slide 
and Hyperloop, many of you would have heard of, uh, and uh, on an autonomous car, you'll be sitting and uh, uh, reading uh, you, or doing your work, car will drive. Um, there are many car, uh, cars, including the Teslas, almost uh, 80 to 90 percent, even the S-Class Mercedes cars today, almost they are autonomous. It's only the regulatory regimes in cities are not allowing it, so we expect next five to ten years, 90 percent of the vehicle on the road are going to be uh, autonomous and electric. So that we have a good presentation, uh, a YouTube video which uh, ISGF did it five years, two three years ago. So which that link is there. I will not go through it. It's about five six minutes. So those who are interested could uh, click on that YouTube video which is there on the presentation and see that. The uh, next uh, uh, slide, please. So future of transport, the, the evolving revolution is going to be a total destruction. In an electric vehicle, which is becoming very popular everywhere, there will be no fuel, no lubricant, unwarranted, the warranty of unlimited mileage, and less than 20 moving parts compared to 2,000 moving parts in an uh, internal combustion engine-based vehicle, no need for regular servicing, automobile service stations and repair shops will disappear almost. This is going to be a, not a revolution is going to be a destruction say millions of jobs will go and with autonomous vehicle millions of drivers will become redundant accident will be almost nil uh, 10 times more vehicle utilization uh, if, if, today 20 hours a day your car stands in expensive parking lots maximum two to three hours is what people drive versus in a shared autonomous vehicle where you will be ordering a vehicle which will come and take you to your destination a vehicle will be driving more than 20 hours a day. This uh, it, it requires only one or two hours for charging. And the vehicle on the road will reduce by 50 to 70 percent total vehicle and parking spaces which we are building may not be required. Many of the parking areas will be redundant. Uh, so we have to look at a, a, a city of 2050. If you are designing today, uh, every person will not be going to the city in a separate car. So we don't need that parking place. And the, the most important concept which has come two years ago is a self-owned vehicle. Vehicles are, are owned by themselves. Uh, paying for the, the mortgage from the digital wallet where they get money by ferrying passengers. But they pay for the insurance and for the charging fee and the management of the uh, managing software which runs them. These are all paid by the vehicle itself and vehicle uh, like robots, they will run and they will, uh, nobody owns them. That's a little difficult concept to comprehend for many, but yes, that's going to be. And we will have a lot of robots working with us uh, in many industries and in offices in the coming days. And there are restaurants which will have robots bringing food from the kitchen. That's going to be more popular after COVID uh, in the very near future. It's been there and experimentally in many parts of the world, including India. But the future is that nobody wants a, 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 a human to bring food from the kitchen to that table. It's all going to be automated very soon. And aerial transportation, which I talked about to you, drone parts instead of car parking, uh, and also uh, highways and roadways, uh, roads and flyways coming in, uh, designed for flying cars. So these are all the major changes which is happening. Uh, and the last 25 years, IT and uh, computer science have changed everything. Next 25 years, the much bigger disruption or destruction is going to be in the transport industry. Next slide, please. Finally, I talk about this uh, instrumented, interconnected, and intelligent. Everything is going to be uh, connected to each other, which is going to bring in humongous efficiency and speed in all our operations, and everything going to be in cloud. Master system integration is a concept which is going to be coming. Every system going to be interconnected with the other systems, which we never thought of in the past. This is what's going to happen. Advanced analytics and robotics is going to be the norm for everything, all new infrastructure. So everything will be interconnected. Uh, yeah, I think many of you have heard about uh, Sophia, the robot, which uh, uh, takes uh, a multi-function uh, Robo is Sophia, which is developed by Hanson Robotics. So we will be, uh, we work closely with the Hanson Robotics at ISGF. My conversations with uh, 
david hansen he talks about connecting our mobile phone which is in our pocket or in our hand with our brain uh, today many things have become all our equipment have become so fast super fast but human interaction with the machines are still very slow it is not even in kilobytes per second it is in bytes per second so once we are able to connect our brain with the, our mobile phones it becomes million times faster of all activities which we are doing innovation will be bound, boundaryless so uh, this is something which uh, people are working around and sometime next month we'll have a, a, a two hour uh, webinar uh, of a conversation between ISGF and uh, David Hansen so and, and also Sophia will be announcing that uh, very soon so thank you very much I stop here if there are questions we'll be happy to answer uh, thank you, Rajesha, for such a detailed presentation. It is uh, really good to hear on such an important topic. Uh, we have uh, some questions for you, and I'll put those to you, sir. Uh, the yes. first is uh, yes, the first is when it comes to any cities, uh, things like road, building, telecommunication, gas, water, and so on are looked after by different service providers isn't it good to bring them under one umbrella what are the difficulties uh, it's basically the the way but things were traditionally here in uh, india so even in uh, many 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 parts of uh, the indian continent which uh, during british time also they allowed many things to be done by the small kingdoms or uh, small uh maharajas or rajas in different states so many things were done by them so land uh, rules are like that so uh, the municipalities were formed in places these are all like that so it was but when you go to north america you find in many places the city government has so much power city government have their own police their own traffic rules their own everything and they, they can borrow money they have balance sheet they can borrow money from the bank so it is run uh, within the city almost everything they do it except their telecommunication and a couple of other things the national government does so <clears throat> that model we have been advocating at least to do that in uh, it, it requires several constitution changes but uh, at least a wave of those things so that uh, smart cities could be uh, developed under one person's ownership uh, the, the ceo of a smart city so we is the debate is still on it, it, it may take long time ideally it has to be like that yes every every person in a city should be under one ownership <coughs> oh, okay thank, thank you sir uh, i would like to put the second one uh, it is the coal power plant versus solar and wind uh, in that we have said that uh, well const construction time do matters but isn't solar and wind covering too much uh, space to generate the same amount of energy compared to the coal power plant uh, year views sir yeah that, that is true yes uh, but we have enough of land in uh, particularly india we have a lot of land in uh, many places unutilized land uh, non-agricultural land and i have seen in china there's something very interesting uh, agricultural land they have put solar panels what they have done the support structure height they have increased so it is about uh, three the lowest uh, level is about three three and a half feet and uh, and below solar panels they are uh, planting uh, fruit bearing uh, plants and medicinal plants and the, the value for the agriculture the farmer is much higher and uh, they they spray water to or uh, they use water for cleaning the uh, 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 the solar panels which goes as water for irrigating the plants and uh, it's, it's coexisting farmers are happy because they are uh, prices have gone up because they instead of earlier making wheat or rice they are making something else which is much more uh, uh, getting them more return like fruits so all these models we can do and uh, maybe it may be very difficult for small countries like maldives or bhutan to have so much of uh, uh, land but then all other SAR countries have enough of places and another thing which we have done is floating solar so all the hydroelectric uh, uh, station dam and in uh, first again this was experimented by mr modi uh, when he was chief minister in uh, gujarat there are a lot of canals they built for irrigation purposes and bringing water to gujarat many uh, parts of gujarat are uh, semi-arid 
So on, on the canal, he, he, he constructed one kilometer. In 2012, he created one kilometer of as a pilot project. Put over the canal, they put solar plants, uh, solar panels. And uh, interestingly, it has shown that about 20% more it uh, they, they generate compared to the land because this uh, the bottom of the panels are always colder because of the water. And at the same time, almost 30% uh, evaporation of the water from the canal has come down. So they, they have, they, they wanted to put it on thousands of kilometers, but then uh, uh, there were several difficulties in uh, doing that. And by the time he moved to Delhi, his focus has shifted to bigger things. So over the canals, we can put the solar panels. Over the uh, lakes and uh, uh, dams, uh, bigger dams, we can put solar panels. It can be done in a shallow sea, even in Maldives, in the uh, uh, smart grid roadmap for SARC Energy Center, which we, ISG have prepared in 2018. We recommended that some offshore wind farms and uh, floating solar may be considered in the shallow sea areas. Over uh, to you, Baskar. Uh, thank you so much, uh, sir. I have uh, one question from my own side, actually. Maybe it is... Uh, uh, interesting for other countries also. So how is the work of ISGF linked with the government plans on smart grid? How these two are uh, related, sir? Okay, ISGF is set up by Ministry of Power in 2011 as a, 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 a not-for-profit society. We, uh, we come under the Societies Act. So we have members, it's a member-based organization, uh, Ministry of Power and a couple of other government entities like uh, uh, power Finance Corporation, Central Electricity Authority, Central Power Research uh, Institute, Central Electricity Regulatory Commission, and the Bureau of Energy Efficiency. The six entities were the founding members. And they invited uh, uh, utilities, regulatory commissions, and uh, industry uh, and academia to join as members. Today we have close to 200, 200 members uh, covering most of the IITs are our members. There are several regulatory commissions. We have some 27 or 28 electricity distribution companies, our members. Uh, some of the transmission companies are our members. So, uh, and industry also. Several, you, when you go to indiasmartgrid.org, you will find it. So, uh, the first task which we had done in 2012 was to formulate a smart grid roadmap, a smart grid vision and roadmap for India. This we that done it with an extensive stakeholder consultations and we prepared the roadmap and submitted to Ministry of Power in the end of 2012 and Ministry also had several stakeholder consultations and in uh, August 2013 it was issued as India's national uh, uh, plan, uh, smart grid vision and roadmap that is already there but uh, what has happened is that uh, many of the targets and numbers which were there in that uh, 2013 roadmap that has been drastically changed by the new government uh, under uh, Mr. Narendra Modi in 2014. So we talked about 20,000 megawatt of solar power by 2020. So Modi Sam has changed that, that to 100,000 megawatt of uh, solar uh, energy by 2022. So like that, uh, some of the numbers have increased. Otherwise, by and large, we are still following the same smart grid roadmap. And again, in, in, in that, we talked about having a smart grid mission. Instead of a government uh, program, it has to be in a mission mode. So in 2014, we, or 2015 actually, it came into existence. We launched a smart grid uh, mission, national smart grid mission, NSGM. It is already functional. And uh, that uh, uh, work was actually done, the framework for that we have done. We work with, besides Ministry of Power now, we work with several other ministries like Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. We work with the Bureau of Indian Standards for Standards. The smart meter standards published in 2015, we worked on that. We worked on with the regulatory commissions. The, the, there is a Central Electricity Regulatory Commission, which is a national one. Uh, the, um, plus, every state has its own state regulatory commissions. So all of them put together, there is a statutory body called Forum of Regulators. We worked with Forum of Regulators. We made presentations for advocating different things. So we advocated for a separate electricity tariff for electric vehicle charging. So uh, on the electric vehicle charging part, we work closely with the uh, earlier with the uh, Department of uh, Heavy Industries, which are the uh, the nodal ministry. But uh, now uh, most of that work has transferred to 
Niti Aayog or the SQL Planning Commission and Department of Science and Technology. We work with those uh, entities. We work with the Department of Telecommunication because nothing smart can be smart means communicable. You should be able to have two-way communication with a system. Uh, then only you can call it a smart system. So without communication, you can't do anything. So we have been working with the telecommunication uh, center, uh, telecom, telecom engineering center, TEC, and Department of Telecommunications right from beginning in 2012. We conducted several brainstorming sessions. We advocated for additional spectrum to be allocated for machine to machine communications. In 2015, we, along with the uh, Department of Telecommunications, we launched M2M uh, roadmap for India. So, which we are prepared by ISGF very closely with the for the power sector, and we uh, there we advocated that uh, additional seven uh, megahertz of uh, spectrum should be released. So, finally, in 2018, TRAI Telecom Regulatory Authority of India they approved that and uh, 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 accepted seven uh, megahertz of free spectrum for machine to machine communications. So we have today only uh, two uh, megahertz. That is. 865 to 867 we have two megahertz uh, now it's going to be augmented by seven more which is being allocated by wireless planning committee similarly we work very closely with the on the cyber security side with an a, a, a agency called national critical information infrastructure protection center so jointly we have been conducting training programs we have created a national uh, a, a manual indian manual on cyber security jointly we have assessed the utilities on their readiness for uh, or in case of a cyber attack so and the, the finding of each of those utilities which we assessed we shared with only them but common findings top 10 common findings we have shared with all the utilities and given to ministry of power and prime minister office so this particular entity work directly under the prime minister office under the national security advisor nciipc so uh, a variety of uh, Government stakeholders, we work closely, and our recommendations have been taken very seriously uh, in many cases. So you, now we are going to launch a program on 250 million smart meters. Smart meters are going to be made mandatory. It was about to be announced uh, sometime in March or April. It is already there in the budget speech of the finance minister in February because of the COVID, things are getting slightly delayed. Uh, all 250 uh, million electricity customers are going to be brought under the smart metering the game very soon maybe in just three to five years it will be implemented and on the energy storage integration of renewable which you have talked about i had told in a very close coordination with the ministry of power the central electricity authority and the media of the h2l planning commission and mnre we prepared the the national roadmap for the energy storage energy storage system roadmap for india 2019 to 2032 so this is also a government document today you can find all these documents on isgf website so i hope this addresses your uh, and we also work with several international agencies we conduct uh, workshops with the uh, european commission with the uh, u.s department of commerce and the usaid uh, with the french smart grid association uh, a variety of uh, stakeholders we conduct annual workshops now under the horizon 2020 program of uh, european commission for the first time in 2018 we uh, through our work we got the start a, a, a component in india so a three million euro project was awarded to nadis the french distribution company and tata power daily distribution to implement a, a, a smart grid project in india this is exactly same project will be done in france as well as in india same technology in two different contexts to evaluate that and under the new program new call which is already announced by european commission in it was actually announced in september 2019 but they are relaunching it in it in may there is 20 million euro smart grid project they have announced three or four projects will be done in india and the same thing will be done in europe also 10 million euro from European side, 10 million euro from India from the Department of Science and Technology. So, several projects uh, uh, US uh, government also funded in India. These are all we've been advocating with all these people. Uh, one uh, in 2013, government of India allocated 14 smart grid pilot projects. Unfortunately, about 10 of them only could be completed. Three, four of them we had to drop on the way. So, one project uh, ISGF to complete. NEDO, New Energy Technology Development Organization, 
on NEDO, uh, Japan, and Japan agreed to fund one project in Panipat. They spent about 144 crore rupees for that project, complete grant. So Japanese technology been implemented in India, and right? So we work in a, a very transparent and uh, uh, brutally neutral. So uh, although we have industries as our member, we don't uh, work on one side of it. What is good for the country, good for the community, uh, good mm -hmm. for future is something which we promote. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I, I would like to thank the whole team of uh, Indian Smart Grid uh, for their excellent presentations. Uh, we really thank, learned a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank, we, thank you very much. We, we really learned a lot. Uh, now, thank you. So much, no. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for participating. Uh, next, uh, we have the last presentation of the day uh, on uh, future of power and utilities companies uh, by Mr. Sandeep Kumar Mohanty, Director Power and Utilities, uh, PwC India. Mr. Sandeep has over 10 years of uh, professional experience in management consulting. He has supported several state and central governments entities investor global utilities and private equity client on financing strategy market research uh, financial modeling commercial and technical due diligence and strategic advice on growth market entry and expansion he holds a master's degree in business management specializing in finance and strategy and is a graduate in computer engineering mr sandeep is a keynote speaker in various conferences now I would like to request Mr. Sandeep uh, to go ahead with your presentation. Over to you, sir. Um, thank you, sir, and thank you to SEC for providing me this opportunity to speak again on this important topic. And uh, I was listening um, to the previous presentation. There is so much relevance to uh, how the energy and more I think the city planning uh, services is getting involved. So a lot of things are happening are I think the time for a big technology change. I mean, it took 60 years for telephone for telephone service to change. Uh, excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Uh, there is some echo with your voice. Uh, is it uh, possible to add just a little bit? Is it better? Some echo is there, sir. Hello? Hello, hello. Yeah, is it better now? No, no, it's still the same, sir. Hello? Hello, hello. Go ahead, let us see one, sir. Sure. Um, so, Thank you. Um, I want to express my thanks to SC for inviting me to speak on this topic. I am, am I clear now, sir? It looks like the fan or something else uh, it is uh, running in your room. Okay. I do not know if it is like better now yes. or not. Now it's okay. Now it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I really want to thank SEC for this opportunity uh, for presenting um, on this uh, global energy transformation. Uh, and I was listening to the previous presentations as well. Um, I think it's an amazing initiative because there's a lot of things which is happening in the world, uh, both in terms of uh, demographics, people's, uh, people's want and technology, all of which we believe will change the way that uh, we see the world and we live in the world today. So, um, so with that, I want to begin this topic and take you through what we believe as uh, will be uh, uh, maybe the things that will change uh, the way that our sector um, is constructed today. So, slide one. 
<laughs> right. So first to understand uh, what are the big changes that we are expecting in the power sector, uh, it's important to understand what are the mega trends which are affecting sectors across the globe. In PwC, we have identified uh, we have identified five big mega trends. So these five big mega trends are demographic and social change, shift in global economic power, and rapid urbanization, climate change and resource scarcity, and technology based breakthrough. Now, let me take you through each one of them and what this they I mean, most of these are very easily understood, but a little bit of depth into that. Technology innovation. So technology innovation today is at the heart of uh, whatever shifts is happening across sectors. Advances are happening in many parts of power sector also. Now, for example, uh, you know, we have large scale technologies such as offshore wind or high voltage DC transmission and distributed system, uh, small scale customer based energy systems, and also on the remote side, there are several innovations which are happening. Power is being transformed from being a top down centralized system uh, because if you look at earlier, we used to have large grids, large distribution companies, integrated companies. So this, this is evolving and it is evolving from centralized and uh, from a centralized system to much more fragmented uh, elements. So in many in jurisdictions, in fact, if you see in many countries, renewable power, for example, is replacing um, you know, fossil fuel generation. Smart grids are delivering um, you know, far better data and, um, and uh, service well, and uh, service quality to uh, the grids across the system. So there's a lot of technology uh, shifts which are happening, and these technology shifts are driving the way uh, that the assets are constructed and the way that uh, products are delivered to our customers. Second is uh, climate change and resource scarcity. So uh, if you see that. The energy sector, which is on the front line in terms of concerns about climate change, the sector as a whole accounts for more than two thirds of global greenhouse gas emissions, with just over forty percent stemming from just power generation. Resource scarcity, because as we see that coal and uh, you know, fossil uh, fossil fuel will slowly, at some point, uh, keep on uh, diminishing. We've already seen that trends in many of the smaller countries. Uh, so, resource scarcity or availability and the associated geopolitical changes, all of this will become a key factor in shaping um, you know, our market policy because, uh, because it's not just about climate change and resource scarcity, but it's also about how geopolitical countries are aligning, people want energy security uh, within their own country, and for which renewable energy becomes a very, very important component. Energy efficiency has also risen up because of policy and customer agenda, together with renewable uh, technologies, energy savings, and a different customer outlook are leading to a transformation of electricity environment. They are causing the value chain to shift away from large conventional power plants towards more local power generation. The greater focus on distributed and local energy systems. The next is demographic changes. Um, now, if it's, I mean, this is, a, we often call this as a cliche, but in the very next minute, the, the population of the world rises to about 1 by 152 on an average. Uh, if we just take this rate, uh, by 2025, we'll be, uh, we will have added another close to 1 billion people uh, in the next five years. Now, this explosive growth, um, especially in some spaces like um, Africa and Asia, um, uh, against decline in some other areas, are creating a very different kind of power market potential, which will also see that many of the large companies, technology providers, are moving away from the West towards investing in some of these emerging economies. Growth, in fact, is price for power companies. So uh, that demographic change will lead to a lot of interest and investments in Africa and Asia, and that's what we will see. A shift in economic power, which is again closely related, that uh, uh, the focus of global growth has shifted. Uh, historically, it used to come from the western part of the world, uh, but at present, it is all about Asia and Africa. Um, now, we've already seen significant east to west and east to south investments coming in power markets. 
um, for example, uh, and, uh, we, we see a lot of uh, European com companies investing into uh, into Asia. We see a lot of Chinese companies migrating out. Uh, so all that is to, uh, all that is because there is a shift in economic buying power. Uh, there is already a plateauing out in elsewhere in the world, uh, but it's these markets which are actually going to grow. And finally, you know, rapid urbanization. Over the next two decades, it's estimated that. Nearly, um, um, uh, all of the lowest growth will be happening um, through the um, through the urban urban centres. Uh, by 2015, that's in the next 13 years, we can expect urban population to increase. Just urban population to increase by about 2.5 billion. Now, in this, of course, the pace and nature of urbanization, economists can take a different route. Uh, for example, we will not see too much urbanization happening now in the West, but I will it more concentrated on Africa and Asia. Uh, and power companies actually can play a very pivotal role in ensuring that future of cities uh, can become urban smart rather than urban strong that we see today. So these are the five big mega trends which we which we feel is happening in the world and which will change the way that uh, the power sector shapes up in future. Now, in the next slide, what we will see is that how are these um, how are these five trends? What are the disruption dynamics they are creating in the power sector? Next slide. Next slide. Right. So the disruption that's taking hold in the power sector is just the start of energy transformation, and that's what we believe in. Now, it's not a question of whether the business models pursued in the sector will change, but rather what new firms will come to take place and how rapidly these companies um, have to alter their course. Uh, companies need to be sure that they are fully factored in the strategic planning, the mega trends, and the changes that are happening in the industry. Uh, the pace of change can be different in each market. I mean, it can be quick in, in China, it can be um, you know, slow in Nigeria, uh, but the pace of change might be different, but it is going to change. And, uh, and each of these specific situations will require a different kind of response. Uh, the most important thing for companies is that they assess their strategy and implement the changes they need to uh, in time or well ahead of time so that they are able to respond to this changing market. Now, in these five uh, mega trends that we have seen, we have seen basically disruption happening in five key areas. One, customer behavior, second, competition, uh, third, production and service model, fourth, distribution channels, and fifth, government regulations. Uh, customer behavior. Uh, so we already see a gradual variation of power utility revenues. I mean, some of the large, uh, some of the large utility companies we are seeing that their revenues is going down, and it's a distributed energy companies which are uh, which are gaining for them. So we, uh, and every year in India also we are seeing the rooftop companies rising, the valuations going at a much Yeah, valuation is going at a much more um, um, uh, at a much more quicker pace um, uh, than uh, the normal traditional grids. Uh, that is so. Uh, so that's the change in customer behavior we believe that uh, with the uh, with the massive rise of social media, customers today have a voice. Um, so uh, utilities and the companies will have to be much more responsive to that. Uh, second is competition. Uh, energy transformation is shifting the opportunity for good margins into only parts of value chain, uh, but lower values of entry in these areas uh, of the value chain and the need for new capabilities would mean that there is prospect for existing companies to be outflanked. And in fact, it is already happening. Uh, we see that uh, you know, some of the large tech giants, for example, SoftBank, today has a huge presence in, uh, in renewable energy sector. Uh, similarly, Google and um, uh, Google and Amazon have their own energy products today. We, are, we have their own uh, renewable energy plants today, uh, smart home companies. So, uh, so there's a lot of competition that traditional utilities will face uh, from new age companies because the values are coming down. 
Third one is um, the production service model. Uh, the production service model again today was more like a centralized generation of grids uh, being joined to form a much more disintermediated and distributed model. A new supply uh, sources requiring centralized infrastructure such as offshore wind are coming on stream. But the dangers of the utilities, so the current utilities is that other assets and infrastructure are left stranded. Centralized infrastructure that has long been a source of strength for, uh, for the industry can be a source of weakness and vulnerable to the market policy or disaster risk. And we all see all three of these uh, risks currently playing out in large parts of, um, of Europe, in fact, for example, in the US and uh, also Eastern Asia. So, um, so today, I mean, earlier what centralized infrastructure used to be uh, a strength in which we can connect um, uh, connect load centers and demand centers. Today, it is uh, it actually can be a source of weakness for us. So, so that's the production service model, the distribution channel uh, in a digital uh, based smart energy era. Uh, the expectation is that the main distribution channel will be online. Uh, energy retailing prices will hinge on innovative digital platforms to supply energy automation, only generation and energy efficiency in customer space. Um, so today, I mean, a lot of even uh, in India, some I mean, many of the uh, traditional government-owned utilities are moving for years into, um, uh, into smart energy. Uh, but uh, and, and this, of course, a lot of the technology has already been driven from West countries like UK, etc. But we do see that there may be regulatory change and then business model change, which will drive this change faster within countries in Asia. And finally, is government and regulation. Energy by its nature is a key economic and political issue. And all of us know this. And um, more than many other sectors, firms in the power sector will depend on political context for their license to operate public trust in their activities in a key and in a big factor. Uh, government and regulations, and government, in fact, is um, today across, I think, um, uh, a large part of Asia um, and South Asia basically are paying attention to climate change. We are realizing that they can have have a large uh, you know, role to play in terms of promoting renewables, etc. So we'll find a lot of green um, driven initiatives coming on ground and companies will now need to adjust to that. So these are the five uh, disruptive dynamics that we see uh, happening in the power sector today. Now, uh, we looked at the bigger trends, we looked at what is changing. Uh, it's now also important to look at what the future market will look like and how will the companies of tomorrow look like? And that's what our subsequent uh, slides are all about. Next. Right. So, um, so what we're seeing is, and this is a, a, a traditional value chain that we have, uh, centralized generation that is what we used to follow um, on, uh, across the world, that to have large gigawatt-sized power plants, uh, which are located close to resources, uh, wherever there is coal or wherever there is gas, or you know, the coastal line we used to have these large generation centers. And these generation centers were connected by large mega distribution grids um, and connected and um, uh, to the demand centers wherever there's industrialization or urban centers happening. Now, what we are going to see in centralized generation, because there is no movement and migration towards distributed generation, we we'll see that increasingly the, uh, the plant utilization of these large generation, centralized generation will keep on coming down um, and there will be a high growth uh, in renewables. In fact, if you uh, look at in India, uh, this is already a trend. Um, our, Average capacity utilization for large thermal plants has come down from uh, from 75 percent uh, in about five seven years back uh, to today to close to about 60 percent. So there's a 15 percent fall, and it's largely because uh, demand hasn't grew. there's a lot a lot of uh, energy efficiency measures which have taken place, which is why demand growth has come down from six percent to uh, three and a half four percent, uh, as well as bulk of this is now being met by renewable energy. Project, uh, uh, renewable energy projects. Um, transmission and distribution. 
Now, uh, in transmission and distribution, I mean, we are already seeing that uh, because of the rise in renewable energy, which is much more renewable in nature, the investment in complex transmission and distribution systems is on rise. Um, companies are exploring uh, strategy, uh, active compensators uh, or multiple redundancies to take care of this volatility of current. Uh, in general, we are going to see, uh, I mean, we expect that uh, there will be about 50% more redundancy that needs to be built in into the system to cater to the group in renewables. Um, the next is energy trading and retail. Um, again, in energy trading and retail, we believe that there will be very, very sharp competition. Already in India, we have seen uh, the trading margins coming down from 7 to 10 paise to right now to about 1 paise per unit. Um, so there will be more intense competition in this. That's what we believe in. Uh, so these are the three segments, which are traditional segments, where we feel that opportunities will actually come down. And the next two segments, which is about metering and behind the meter services is somewhere where we feel that um, opportunities are going to go up. Um, a lot of behind the meter services, for example, distributed generation, smart homes, electric vehicles. I won't talk about this much. Uh, my previous presentation presenter had took a, 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 a lot, I spoke a lot on these uh, storage solutions, demand response. We believe that this is the big market which is going to go up, which means that essentially the current companies today will find it very difficult to compete with tech companies who are sharp and big in these particular services. So which means that some of the utilities have to change uh, their business models, their outlooks from today itself. Next slide. Um, so this is uh, this is more uh, sort of a question which companies need to ask themselves that within these four disruptive uh, issues which is happening, um, what is the questions that they need to ask and how they need to change? I won't dwell too much on this because uh, you know, this is more for internal consumption of the companies themselves. We can move to the next slide. Right. So what is the disruption and how is the power markets going to be disrupted? So uh, and within this, we believe that each of the stakeholders, which is customers, private sector, and government, will play their definitive role in individual market space. Now, um, so what this table basically shows us is that uh, the different kind of stakeholders, customers, private sector, government, who are going to drive the change, and whether this and whether the system will be uh, will remain as it is, or there will be incremental change or transformation change. So these, that's what we've classified the different energy markets um, and how each stakeholder is going to play in that. Now, the first one is, of course, the classic energy market, what we have today, right? So we have a centralized generation, large grids, monopoly distribution companies. There will be some private involvement, but it will largely be governed by government. This is the thing which we feel that it will not change, and uh, this kind of system, while it will be part of the entire uh, of the entire energy value chain, will very, very soon lose its dominance. Um, incremental change are valued uh, innovations and regulatory and innovations. So basically, this is what uh, what we in later half will talk about genitalia models, so open access models where uh, private sector setting up uh, capacities on their own and directly selling to uh, to customers, providing them um, uh, some sort of technology tools to monitor their consumption to optimize this consumption. So these are very small incremental change. Largely, we are playing within the market definitions that are uh, the market uh, boundaries that are set by regulators, but private sector is trying to innovate in that space. The transformation change which, uh, which we feel is going to happen, uh, government will need to gain command and control. So uh, we we'll talk about this command and control in little later, but uh, uh, command and control is basically where, um, uh, where large renewable capacities and enabling regulations are set up, and this will be driven by government. Uh, private sector will go for regional supergrid, uh, and customers will be looking at local energy systems and distributed energy generation. So this is the kind of business models that we see which will be transformational in the future. Next. Right. So, uh, so we spoke about what are the major trends which are changing, um, changing our uh, 
which are having an impact on the power sector. We have looked at what is within the power sector uh, changing, uh, those five factors, uh, which is customers, etc. Uh, now we're going to look at what, what are the future market designs I and mean, what are the four different kinds of markets and who will be the guys who will be controlling these markets. Um, so the first one is what we call, and I'll start with the second one first, green command and control, because that's where uh, government will have a lot of role. So green command and control market scenario represents a market in which government will own and operate energy uh, energy sector. Typically, this is um, this is what we will find in very small uh, economies that private sector participation just doesn't make sense right now. Um, in this uh, in this green command uh, system, what even what we believe will happen is that uh, government will have a mandate and this mandate can come from UN, can come from a next round of uh, climate change initiatives, will be to adopt large renewable generation and digital technology. So it will all be driven by government when the limited private sector involvement. Now this again as I said will typically happen in, um, in small countries or countries where uh, where today um, uh, you know, public sector goal is uh, significant. So, uh, for example, some of the small Asian countries like Bhutan, etc. today, we will not see too much, I and mean, there is no benefit in bringing too much private sector. It will be largely driven by uh, by government sector, and that is what it will contain. Um, the second kind of business model uh, that we are talking about here is ultra distributed generation. So ultra distributed generation um, the market scenario represents a market in which generators are invested in distributed renewable infrastructure with investment decisions based on policy incentives or economic business cases. It's a market with full unwinding and strong customer engagement both in retail and as micro generators. This is something that we are already seeing in a lot of markets. So today, for example, in India, you have large generating companies who also own small distributed generation. Uh, there are likes of Renew Power, Clean Max, etc. who have small distributed generation across customers and they directly engage with some of these commercial and industrial customers. Uh, provide them energy as well as some of the other adjacent solutions. So this is in a way ultra distributed generation, not an ultra but distributed generation we have already started seeing and um, probably the next round of evolution will be towards this. Local energy system. Local energy system is actually the uh, the last end of transformation that we believe, in which uh, uh, basically in this we will see a significant fragmentation of not only generation but also transmission and distribution system. A lot of the asset ownership will will best for the community or investors. Um, and this kind of model we are already seeing uh, developed in Scandinavian countries, where a small uh, small community has enough resources to mobilize their own local energy system. Uh, so they need not only their energy environment as a community, but also export outside. So here, uh, the private sector role will be moved towards providing platforms and services, whereas the asset ownership will be fragmented, moving away from private or public sector more towards customers. So that's the, uh, that's the, uh, you know, the most transformational model that we will see. Uh, uh, then the first one, which in a way it is we already seen it in Europe, etc., but it's unlikely, and that's why I kept it last. It's unlikely that we will see uh, a lot of it happening in, in Asia because in Asia, uh, the grid ownerships typically rests with, uh, with, public, uh, with public utilities. So, this is a super good scenario that isn't a market in which uh, there is a pan national. Um, um, National entity which is designated to transfer renewable energy and other energy. Uh, it's likely to embrace some degree of unbundling and customer choice, um, but not to a fair degree. It would require large scale renewable generation interconnections, uh, large scale storage, and significant levels of transmission capacity. Now, again, as I said, this may not be too much relevant for Asian context because, in our case, regional supergrids are not owned by. Um, uh, by uh, Private entities owned by uh, owned by the public entities in uh, in, in this sort of world. So so this is the kind of food kind of uh, you know market models that we're going to see in future. Now based on this market designs, what kind of business models can we have? 
Um, and that's what we are going to talk about in the next slide. Next. 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 So this is uh, the eight different kinds of market models that we are going to, uh, business models that we've seen are going to evolve. Now, depending on how the sources play out, each one of this model can be different and uh, you know, companies will have to, uh, have to adapt depending on how their market design works and what is their, um, what is basically their uh, strengths and weaknesses. So basically, uh, if you look at these are, uh, these eight models, uh, we have also listed down what is the business focus area, whether the focus will be on assets or whether it will be more on customers. Uh, the second uh, way that we have is about business alignment. Uh, what each of these business models would encompass? For example, traditional core business will mean it's generation, PMD, and retail. Uh, whereas JPL means it's only generation and retail. It will not contain PMD in this case, it will be largely owned by government entities. And what will be the profitability basis, um, whether it will be competition, whether it will be regulated, uh, what kind of competition will be there, that's uh, that's what defines the profitability basis. Uh, so, so let's talk about the traditional core businesses. So this is what, this is the kind of business model we already have today. Uh, there is a generating company, there is a transmission and distribution company, and there is a retail function. Now, retail function in many of our countries uh, often rests with, with the distribution companies. So it can be the distribution company or it can be separate, but irrespective, there are three different um, there are three different businesses, and this can be primarily owned by public or private sector. Uh, there would be there would not be much competition even if there is retail, um, and the tariffs would be largely determined by an independent regulator, which is based on an ROC principle. You know, uh, cost plus uh, principle. So, so that's the traditional business model that we have. Uh, the next is a Gentile business model. Now, a Gentile business model, it's assumed that the transmission network is largely owned by public sector. And here, um, a Gentile utility will operate only at the two ends of the value chain, that is owning the generation assets and selling retail energy to customers in a competitive market. Uh, Gentiles would end up paying a charge to the transmission and distributed system operators, which will be largely government uh, for buying and selling. Um, uh, energy and uh, so so this this, this business model we, we have we have already seen in many other countries uh, including parts of India uh, we have already seen this kind of model in Australia UK and New Zealand as well so uh, most of the countries which have adopted the UK model uh, have uh, have gone with Gentile models so in in general model I think this uh, a company our, our company can be successful which has strong capabilities in demand in estimating demand and forecasting. So uh, any company which should be able to do that uh, will have a uh, edge over other companies. So that's the general business model for us. Uh, the next is a pure, uh, pure merchant business model. So pure merchant business model is essentially um, where the utility owns an operation, operates generation assets, and sells power in a particular wholesale market. Now, in, in a way, a parts of pure merchant market already exists in some of the large countries. Uh, so this is basically a generator sets up merchant capacity. So he's not worried about uh, uh, energy retail, not worried about transmission, all these things functions are taken by somebody else. Now, again, in the PMD merchant market, which we have already seen, uh, uh, the profitability will be basically competition. So there will be demand forces, supply forces, and based on that, the competition uh, will, uh, will determine what the prices are. Now, a yeah, PMD merchant, um, there have been successful stories in West. In US, for example, this merchant market has been extremely successful. Uh, but uh, in Asian context, a uh, pure merchant has not been that successful. Uh, at least not in recent times. 
And this is a great development, which is uh, purely about transmission assets. Uh, so in this case, the company acquires, uh, develops and constructs homes and buildings, transmission assets. And these transmission assets connect to generators and distribution operators. Um, in most cases, this uh, you know, uh, great developer, it will be a regulated business because transmission by its nature is a monopoly business. And um, and uh, and it will be mostly on either on a utilization based charge or on a um, rental uh, charge, annual charge that they will be charging, and it has to be regulated based on the cost precision. Uh, next is the network manager. Network manager is uh, is not very different from grid developer, uh, but in this case, uh, it also owns um, the distribution networks, transmission as well as distribution networks. Again, very similar. It will be largely a uh, um, and next is uh, product innovator, which is uh, uh, product innovator will be a company that offers electricity as well as certain behind the meter products to the customers. Now, this model uh, would focus expanding the wave of energy retailer and changing the level of customer expectations. Um, now, the product innovative model will be most relevant for markets where the regulatory framework allows choice. But today, in most of South Asian economies, the, uh, uh, there is basically a, a monopoly of uh, energy retailers. But wherever there is a matter of choice, for example, in, uh, under the Electricity Act Amendment in India, we are, we are planning to bring in a retail competition. Now, if that happens, then uh, the product innovator uh, business model will be uh, very successful. So that's the Next kind of business model to get back to them. Uh, the next is partner of partners. Now, this is a very interesting business model uh, in which we are saying that the currently the incumbent utilities will need this is whether we have the requisite experience and portfolio breadth to address the future needs uh, of the customer and their services. For example, when a partner of partners, uh, you can have a single supplier who is supplying electricity, but that electricity uh, company will also have resources uh, which are customer facing and can also take part in uh, in distribution of uh, um, of uh, uh, of digital services. For example, television services. It can also provide gas services, gas distribution services. So, a common manpower can be a common asset or manpower or technology can be utilized for multiple different. Uh, different products and services for the customer. So again, in this partner partners concept, uh, it's in very small ways. It is already happening in some of our uh, countries, um, specifically after the uh, gas distribution has been liberalized. But in a large way in Australia and UK, you have all, I mean, you would find integrated suppliers or the partner of partners concept prevalent. Um, the next business model that we will see evolving is value added enabler. Uh, value added enabler basically leverages the fundamental capacities for information management to expand the role that a utility can provide on the behalf of its customers. When many customers will seek to gain more control over their energy consumption or more choice with respect to energy supply, these customers do not show a uniform desire to always be hands on in decision making regarding their energy use. And these are what we call as enabled customers. And they're, they're not, uh, I mean, even customers you often find in even in telecom sector, for example. Now, it's not necessary that when any supplier is slashing their rate, all the customers from a from a current, from a from a mobile company will migrate to its new uh, competitor. So these are the overt customers, and um, the, a value-added enabler will basically um, will basically have a lot of data. Uh, in which it can drive the services for these inert customers. So it will not be simply dependent on margins, but also what data, um, uh, you know, data added services can be provided. So that's the, uh, that's, uh, you know, today for the problem with many of our South Asian countries is that we are not sure about how the customer data can be utilized. But uh, uh, this customer data is actually very, very powerful tool. And uh, for example, by just 
just looking at the consumption data, uh, we, can, uh, we can tell whether the person um, is a, belongs to a high income group, low income group, whether it is a working class, a business class, or it is comprised of retirees. And all this information is tremendous use for uh, somebody like an FMCG company or a telecom company. So this is this dynamic review will play more on data and electricity will become an add-on component. And finally, is what we call as a virtual utility. Now, a virtual utility will be something like an Amazon, right? So somebody else will own the generation assets, somebody will own the distribution assets. Um, the, uh, the virtual utility will be a platform which just own customers. So for them, uh, it is just the customers and the platform will provide, um, and the platform um, will basically connect uh, asset owners and customers together. Uh, it will be a highly competitive market, but uh, this is what we uh, believe will be the utility for the future. Next. So, uh, so this is what we talked about in terms of the eight different business models. Um, each utility and every company and every country should look to uh, look towards uh, designing its own uh, markets and policies in which uh, different uh, models can play. Uh, it's of course not a journey which is for five years, but it's a journey for uh, for the next two decades. But um, but we are going to see uh, more and more uh, technologies which is changing, and these business models actually going. Size. Next. Right. So, uh, so what will be the levels uh, that, that we need to look up as countries, as uh, planners, as policy makers? Um, one data, um, how, as I was talking about, that is this customer data is extremely powerful. Today, we have technology to capture this data. Uh, how is that being utilized? Uh, and who owns that data uh, will be extremely uh, significant. Uh, next is policies. I mean, what kind of policies will bring about, uh, for example, will it be retail competition? Will it be uh, public monopoly? All that will define, um, define how our industry shape up. Uh, relationship. Uh, basically, how uh, how is the relationship of a utility and a customer, government as a customer, regulators and utilities, these relationships will define the way that business models shape up. Uh, pricing, I mean, this in, in a way we are already seeing there is a shift from the traditional pricing models of cost plus are competitive. Uh, slowly, um, I think we will move from a competitive to a value added pricing. Partnering, um, again, on partnering, we are seeing some uh, many distribution companies, for example, going towards gas transmission license, etc. Uh, we will see uh, more companies coming together, more distribution and similar companies coming together, pooling resources and providing services on a single platform to the customers. And finally, the regulator, because regulator is uh, you know, a key decision maker in the space. What decisions they take can uh, can change the sector for forever. So, so these are the, uh, you know, the six parameters or model uh, or levels which you feel uh, is, in, is there with the country uh, to make a shift in the business model. Next. So, uh, so basically, are some of the questions again we uh, we can ask uh, ourselves: uh, What markets will we emerge in our country? Uh, where, as a company, we want to play? How do we want to play, and how do we want to win? So, these are the four kind of, you know, questions uh, probably a company or a country should ask itself. So, with this, I end the presentation in terms of uh, the future of energy markets, and happy to take up any questions if there are. Hello. Uh, hello. Yes, I, I was saying this is my last slide, and um, uh, maybe we can change just to go up to the first slide, Pradeep. Uh, so, I didn't take up any questions. This was all that I had to present in terms of how energy markets are set to evolve. Happy to take up any questions. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sandeep. Uh, I just uh, I have two questions for you. Uh, 
the first one is uh, on trading company yes sir. you have said that the trading margin is falling down how do you see the future of this trading company right um so sir uh, you know in in many of our markets today the way the trading function operates is that uh, they are just a bridge without a value add uh so we connect a generator and a customer and because of um, some regulatory arbitrages they are able to make margins this is unlikely to stay for a very long time because companies and regulators and policy makers are questioning the role of uh, of a trader uh, without a unique function so yes trader and trading function will continue but in a quite in a in a quite different format uh one of the changes which we have seen is something called aggregators so now traders are um, are playing the role of aggregators for example in india thank you so much uh, sandeep i will put up the second question for you uh hello Yes, sir. Uh, in in the power in the power market, you have uh, long term, medium term, and short short term. So why medium term is uh, not picking up in India? Um, in fact, just so to correct you, in fact, uh, medium term has picked up uh, more than long term in the last uh, three years. In the last three years, we have not signed. Uh, I mean, apart from, of course, uh, close to 17 gigawatts of uh, 18 gigawatts of renewable capacity, solar capacities, and uh, maybe about uh, eight to ten gigawatts of wind. Uh, these are all long term, but on convention space, we have not signed up a single long term contract. uh we have what we have done is we have awarded about 7.5 gigawatts of uh, medium term contracts which is three years and as i was telling about the evolving rule of the um, of um, as trader actually these three um, these three the 2.5 gigawatt tenders which the second one was cancelled so we have about 5 gigawatts of tender in the last three years was awarded by uh, by trading company so in in this what they are doing is that uh, they are bringing multiple suppliers and multiple uh, procurers on a single platform and they are the one who are doing mixing and matching so that's the role they are doing that medium term slowly the game is picking up in and will uh, what we believe that is an except for new this where uh, because of financing and financial market requirements long term pps make sense uh, on convention side we are not going to see long term pps in new we are going to see with more one more medium term pps um, uh, being uh, being replaced uh, by uh, by distribution companies Thank you, Mr. Sandeep, uh, for the uh, detailed uh, answering and presentations. Uh, with, with this, uh, we have come to an end of the webinar. Before we leave, I would once again thank uh, Mr. Rajiv Kumar Pillai, Ms. Rina Suri, Mr. Sudarshan Kundu, and Mr. Sandeep Kumar Mohanty. Thank you, everyone, for attending today's session of this webinar. we had listened to some excellent presentations delivered by our distinguished presenters from the region all the presentations will be available on shark energy center's website very shortly we would love to hear from you for any suggestion and comments for future improvement plus any suggested topics of your interest on which you want us to arrange future webinars we would gladly do that with me signing out thank you again for joining us today and looking forward to see you next time bye bye uh